We have more people here for this municipal uh, candidates meeting than we did for the provincial one, which is great. Because generally people are less interested in municipal affairs, although it is certainly arguable that this level of government is far more uh, important to you in terms of a direct impact. Because everything that you do from day to day, from the roads you travel on, to your property where you live, are very much affected by what the decisions that are made by the folks you're going to be listening to today. So I want to thank all the candidates for being here. A couple of candidates did, uh, were not able to make it, uh, but I appreciate all the candidates being here so that we have a choice. It's a difficult job to be a politician and to subject yourself to the criticism of everybody. And we appreciate the fact, or at least I do, and I think most people should, if they don't already, the job that you're doing so that we have a choice and we can have democracy. Uh, the questions tonight, we, we do not take questions from the floor. We have in the past, but we discovered that from the floor tends to be more speeches than questions. So questions could be submitted up until yesterday, and there is a committee which did not include me, so I could stay as neutral as possible, uh, who selected the questions and made sure that all questions were appropriate. So I'll just be picking them, and we'll be going the order I was given. And we're going to stick to our agenda, which is going to be very tight. We're trying to, to do something which we've never done before, which is a lot more candidates, three wards. We have three trustee candidates who are going to speak as well. And then finally, the two mayoral candidates. So we're going to try to squeeze things and we're going to try to keep things moving as quickly as possible. Uh, my name, by the way, sorry. My name is Stefan Deschamps. I'm the president of the East Columbia Chamber of Commerce. Uh, has organized this event for you this evening. Uh, at the front, uh, we are videotaping this event, so if you want to review what was said after the fact, or if uh, people weren't able to make it, they'll be able to view this uh, likely in the two days, two three days, we need a little bit of time to just upload it and edit it a little bit, uh, and we'll put it on YouTube, and if you follow the chamber on our social media, you'll be able to see it. Um, we have very tight timelines for speaking. Uh, Doug over there has three different panels that he'll be raising, and you'll be able to see them as well as the candidates so that you know how much time they have left. And we believe he's going to be very, very objective and very fair about these things. Uh, by being here, you are consenting to be on video or pictures, uh, because we may take some pictures of the whole room at times or for future uh, promotions or to just uh, talk about this on social media. So. If anybody does not want to be photographed or videotaped, um, this would be your chance to step out of the room. Nobody's standing up. I guess we're okay. Uh, so we are a few minutes early, because I didn't have to say as much as I guess Kathy allowed the time for. So we'll begin right away with the questions for the award one candidates. And so the format for the four candidates will be an opening uh, remark, three minutes each. Uh, they will be doing their speeches from the tables up here. And then there's questions from the panel, which are the ones I was telling you about. One minute to answer the question and then a one-minute rebuttal from any of the candidates who want to rebut what's been said. Uh, we're going to arbitrarily decide to put the names in uh, reverse order, alphabetical order, so we're going to start at this end for the opening statement, and we're going to go back and forth on the questions, unless the question is specifically directed to a candidate, and then after, for the closing, we'll start at the opposite end. So, uh, be as fair as humanly possible. Uh, after the questions, we will ask as many questions as we can squeeze in, depending on the number of candidates, that may take a little longer or less time. And then we'll have two minute closing remarks afterwards. Okay? Any questions on that? No? All good? All right. So why don't we start with the opening remarks? Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Jeremy Smith, and I'm seeking the position of Ward 1 Councillor in East Willembury, October 22nd. 
As a resident of Palm 90 since August 2000, my family and I were attracted to the trail system and local parks, good schools, library and community center, a variety of local shops and services, and affordable housing. The ability to walk around in a safe neighborhood and the opportunity to purchase local produce from farms made the choice of Apollo Landing the right one. Access to road transit and YRT services made it easier for my family to travel to Newmarket, Toronto, and beyond. If elected, my goals moving forward will be centered on preserving the past, enhancing the present, and planning a responsible environmental footprint for the future to meet the needs of the residents in Ward 1 and in East Willenburg. I have spent 20 years as an elementary teacher and 10 years as a vice president of ETFO York Region. As a local VP for 5,100 members, I was responsible for solving member issues, contract negotiations, joint occupation of health and safety, and working with senior administration at YRDSB in the area of labor management. I also had the opportunity to work with my sister organization, ETFO, an organization that represents 70,000 educational workers across the province of Ontario. Working with ETFO gave me a provincial perspective on issues ranging from Bill 148 to working with organizations such as OTIP, WSIB, and the Toronto and York, York Labour Council. All these experiences allowed me to solve issues through respectful dialogue. The landscape of our community is changing, especially in Ward 1. New housing development has put pressure on our older infrastructure systems, such as roads and sewage treatment systems. Increased traffic flow has increased safety concerns and may travel slower when accessing services and getting to work, especially via the 404 or bathrooms. The next East Willenbury Council must address these issues and concerns with public input consultation for any new development is considered. As a recent retiree, I don't have the time and the ability to solve problems through responsible dialogue and understanding. Thank you and look forward to your questions. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming out tonight. It's great to see so many people engaged in our community. Uh, I'd like to take this opportunity also to thank the East Willenbury Chamber of Commerce for uh, hosting this evening. Uh, my name is Cal McMillan. I'm running for Town Council in the new Ward 1, which represents the communities of Harvest Hills, River Drive Park, and Holland Landing. Uh, I'll begin by telling you a little bit about my background and how it fits in with the position I'm seeking here tonight. Uh, my wife Deborah, my daughter Lauren, and I have called East Willenbury home for almost 27 years now. Like many of you, we chose this community at that time because of its unique character. It has been a wonderful place to live and raise a family. And we've been lucky enough to make many great lifelong friends while we've lived here. My professional background includes both private and public sector experience. For 14 years, I worked in the graphic communications industry as a sales and marketing manager for a manufacturer of printing equipment. Currently, and for the last 11 years, I've worked at City Hall in Toronto with two different councillors, serving residents in a ward with a population of over 60,000 people and 20,000 households. In this role, I gained invaluable frontline experience in municipal operations, working extensively on planning, transportation, budget, taxation issues, as well as working directly with other levels of government. It has allowed me to work with the community on everything from large scale developments to small infill projects, major municipal infrastructure projects such as transportation, roads, and sewer various parks and rec improvements, and a vast array of municipal and local community projects such as neighborhood beautification and revitalization initiatives. I know that we've recently seen or read in the news about the circus that's going on at City Hall in Toronto, but for me it's been a great learning ground in the world of municipal politics and governance. It has allowed me to gain invaluable knowledge in the process and procedures, and it has shown me what works and what doesn't work, and how to achieve positive results. 
Most importantly, my experience has allowed me the opportunity to work along with residents to make community improvements and also to advocate directly for residents when there is a need to engage your local government. With your support, my goal is to bring new ideas along with the experience and knowledge I've gained to work for you and our great community. The community my family and I are proud to call on. The spirit of your timelines, I'll be brief. Good evening. My name is Terry Foster, and I'm a candidate for Council of Ward 1. Thank you uh, to all in attendance tonight, uh, with many other things that you could be doing, uh, mainly watching Austin Matthews. Uh, you've chosen to attend this event because you care about this community. That's exactly why I'm here, because I care about this community. What do I bring to the position of an elected official? I'm a lifelong resident of Long Landing. I've been here a long time. I've seen a lot of change, and I remember a lot about this town. Some leadership, past experience in a 35 plus year career in emergency services, serving in many capacities and taking a leadership role in many situations, both emergency and non-emergency. Also serving as an alternate community emergency management coordinator and taking an active role in building and presenting emergency exercises both at the municipal and regional levels. Also, I spent many years working as an assistant manager in the automobile collision industry, leading employees working with customers and insurance companies. I believe I bring transparency. Anybody that knows me knows that I am transparent regarding where I stand on the issues and what I believe in. I'm not afraid to ask difficult questions. I believe the unprecedented growth in East Glowberry is happening far too fast. I hear it from a great number of residents uh, while I've been out knocking on doors. People ask, why does it seem like all of this is happening at the same time? Why should the growth hinder my lifestyle, the traffic, the construction traffic in residential areas and the speed. Traffic is bad enough around town with other construction zones everywhere you go. We need to better handle this growth. We need to try to have a balanced approach so we're not always playing catch up with infrastructure to support that development. This, these are all very difficult tasks, uh, but I would love to be part of a council that would tackle these issues. Transportation in and around East Goldenberry is another issue facing uh, Council again. Uh, YRT is currently looking at ridership and this may bring changes uh, for our residents that depend on that service. The next Council will need to deal with this issue and look at alternative transit and what other municipalities have done might be required as we do not need to reinvent the wheel. And lastly, it's time to take a serious look to make sure the residents are getting good value for their tax dollar. There's always money that could be saved and better directed elsewhere. I have a passion for this community. I'm proud to be from East Bowerberry, and I'm dedicated to the preservation of local history, and that includes the villages and the areas of East Bowerberry. We must not lose the identities of these areas as they serve to make up the uniqueness, if you will, of East Bowerberry. If elected, I will be here to serve. I will represent you with openness and transparency. Transparency. I will support you if you support me. When you are voting, excuse me, voting on election day or um, at the advanced polls, please vote Terry Foster for council in Ward 1. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. And thank you to the Chamber for organizing this debate. And thank you to everyone who showed up tonight for taking part in our democratic process. My name is Laura Lee Carruthers, and many of you know me. I'm a local mother of two. I'm a businesswoman with a background in advertising. I work as a consumer advocate uh, for new homeowners. And for the past 15 years, I've been elected by you to represent East Willowbury on our public, as our public school trustee working to improve our local schools, our bus routes, and student programming, and to ensure accountability to you, the taxpayers. I've successfully advocated for two new schools in East Willowbury in the past few years, Robert Munch in Mount Albert and Phoebe Gilman in Harvest Hills. I've served as chair of our school board 
and as the board's budget chair, I work to manage the school board's $1.5 billion budget responsibly with a strict focus on accountability and transparency. I've been volunteering in our community since my family moved here 25 years ago, including as a member of the Towns Environment Committee and on our public library board. I'm running to be Ward 1 Councillor because I want to continue to serve the community I live in and to use the extensive governance, advocacy, and financial experience I have gained in my long career in order to make your lives better. I want to deliver an affordable quality of life that is second to none for our residents. I hope to use my experience to prudently manage the budget and keep our taxes low, while still ensuring that as the community grows, we make the necessary investments to maintain the level of service our residents have come to expect. We need to invest in recreational facilities, emergency services we can rely on, and to efficiently manage growth in our town. I want to focus on three key areas as your Ward 1 Counselor. First, rejuvenating downtown home landing by revitalizing our streetscapes and making our community more walkable. Secondly, ensuring our town is keeping up with our aging population by investing in facilities, programs, and services for seniors so they don't have to leave our community. And thirdly, to bring better town services such as parks and community facilities to Ward 1 so that we are on par with the rest of the town, especially the area west of the river that has uh, historically been underserved. I have the commitment and the expertise to make this happen as your Ward 1 Councillor. And I look forward to answering your questions tonight. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you very much, Ward 1 candidates. Uh, as you can see, uh, the Dutch Spearing, I apologize if I don't pronounce his name properly, uh, has not has chosen not to attend or for reasons that I'm not sure. Uh, and uh, Joel uh, Kearney did send a statement for me to read, which seems reasonable. Um, he says, Thanks to the Chamber for hosting this event. I wish I could be there with you all, but I have a prior engagement in Vancouver. I did contemplate cancelling my trip in order to attend tonight's event, but felt it would be selfish and fair to all those involved in order to back out of a commitment I made over a year ago. I am fortunate enough, if I am fortunate enough to get elected in Ward 1, you can be sure that I'll show this same level of respect and commitment to both my colleagues and my community. To everyone in attendance, I wish you a pleasant evening and I look forward to meeting you when I return from the West Coast. Joel Kirk. We will now proceed with the questions. As I said, some are directed to specific individuals and others are to all of them. So the first question is directed to all candidates. And the question is, are you concerned that the election of the region chairman has been stopped. What can you tell us about democracy if the most influential position in the region is appointed, not elected? And we'll start at the other end with the board of directors. Thank you. Um, I find it very concerning uh, that this was the first time we'd be able to elect our regional chair. Uh, it was a huge undertaking, people who put their names forward to run in such a huge riding. Um, and I think it, it does speak to uh, uh, less democracy for us because a democracy is about citizens electing the people who lead them. And the regional chair has a lot of power. We have one seat on the region, and uh, so the regional chair is important uh, for people in East Gilbert. And I think that uh, we have to be very careful when our democratic rights are being lessened and uh, take a firm stand. Thank you. I should uh, just do sorry, it's one minute each on this question, that's fine, and one minute rebuttal. Okay. I don't see it as, uh, as a big problem. Uh, I believe uh, the provincial government made some decisions um, that were probably warranted. For all we know, uh, maybe it wasn't set up to work right at the time. Um, I think it's worked well in the past. I don't see any issues with it working well in the future. Uh, that doesn't mean that the future may hold uh, that we do elect that regional chair. When it comes to that time, that'll work fine too. I agree. I don't find a, a big issue with it. I don't think that uh, we as residents were very um, engaged with the bigger government. Um, 
I think that we can move forward on it and we can uh, have our, our uh, representative from town council representatives at, at the region. And I think that's a, a, a good compromise. Yeah. I look at this, I look at this as kind of a two-sided point. This is interference in our democracy. There's no doubt about it. And if if, the, if it was decided that we were going to elect the regional chair, then that should have went ahead. I'm kind of hoping that from the court decision from today, around uh, Bill 5, I'm hoping in the future that maybe we can go ahead and, uh, and try to understand what that decision is going to be. But on the other side is, and we've heard it from two other two country councils here, is it, you know, do we not need another level of bureaucracy on top of us. So I'm kind of torn between those two things because a lot of our services in the security zone way are regional. So I'm kind of kind of torn about that. But it's thinking, you know what? It is an, it is an intrusion into our democracy, and I hope somebody takes it to the court. Thank you. Three bottles. One minute. Um, one thing to keep in mind is 46 percent of your tax dollars go to the region. And a you know, fundamental principle of democracy is, is representation, is taxation. So with that amount going to the region and us being, only having one seat on that regional council, I find it uh, very concerning. And I think that we all should have a voice in electing the chair. Anyone else? The next question was actually directed towards only three candidates, but I'm going to Directed to all of them since it's most of them in Europe. Uh, I would like to know from the candidates what qualifications or experience in government they have. So we'll start with Jerry and Smith. This. For myself, uh, dealing with the government, especially of the government of Ontario, since 2012, I've been knee deep in Bill 115. And for those who are not teachers in the audience, on September 1st, 2015, all teachers across Canada, across Ontario, were stripped of their sick days and had their maturity frozen. So, through their, my provincial colleagues at ETFO, we've been work, I've been working with the government, working through them to engage the government on these issues. We did take them to court over Bill 150, and we won. We did it through dialogue through our provincial colleagues. As I mentioned previously, I've worked for. Uh, Two city councillors in the city of Toronto for over 11 years. Uh, it's been an intensive, exciting experience for me, and it's taught me how government works, how municipalities work, and it's taught me the good and the bad of how everything works. So um, that's my experience. Thank you. I don't believe I have any special experience uh, in government that. Uh, would make a big difference other than uh, 35 plus years working for the municipality in, in both a paid on call uh, position and, and a career position. We had great interaction with council and the mayors. Uh, we were kept very well informed of what was going on. You can't help but get interested. So I thought at some point if I got interested and I had opinions on things, I probably should throw my name in the ring and see what happens. Thank you. Well, as a trustee for 15 years, uh, trustees are the oldest form of government uh, in Ontario. So uh, having that role, I learned about policy making, uh, but representing constituents and advocating on their behalf. Uh, as a trustee, I was elected to be vice president of the Ontario Public School Boards Association. I was down at Queen's Park regularly, um, being their spokesperson and advocating on their behalf um, with uh, the minister directly. Uh, as chair of the board, I was down again at Queen's Park advocate, advocating with the government to make sure that we got the things that we needed for our schools in York Region, um, as well with Terry on, um, uh, who worked with the, uh, many of the ministers and, and worked directly with them. Um, the experience that all of these roles have given me in both policy making and representing people, as well as oversight and uh, managing large budgets, uh, will uh, really serve me well if you elect me as your councillor. Thank you. Three miles? No? Okay, that was straightforward. This question is also addressed to all candidates. Affordable, affordable homes are non-existent in EG. What will council 
council do to ensure developers provide those types of homes for both youth and retired residents looking to downsize? And we'll start with Lori Carruthers. Thank you. This is something that I've heard at the door while I'm knocking on doors. Affordable housing is so important. Many people are leaving the city because it's just no longer affordable. And I think we have to uh, look to the developers when they're coming in. Uh, they are businessmen. They want to make a profit. So they're building the best, biggest, most expensive houses they can. Uh, and we need to uh, put some controls on that and make sure that along with that, there's affordable housing as well. Um, as the question stated, we need to be thinking uh, of our youth so that they can uh, get into their own homes, uh, as well as our seniors so that we can keep them in town. When our parents age, we don't want to be sending them out of town. So uh, affordable housing can be smaller houses, uh, it can be apartments, it can be seniors' residences, um, but we do need to do a better job in these big houses that I see going in. I just think uh, we might be going the wrong way with that. Thank you. Each development that uh, is currently being built and built in the future um, are all mandated to have a certain percentage of high density or what we would refer to as affordable housing. Uh, that's a very difficult question to ask people sitting up here at the front because the municipality does not drive the real estate market. It's nice to say that you're going to have affordable housing, uh, but if the houses are uh, selling for a certain amount of money, uh, the municipality can do a lot about it. Uh, so again, all those developments are, are slated to have the high density, the condominiums, or, or however they work out. Uh, I don't know what more this municipality can do. Uh, I think that uh, there's, after looking at the official plan, uh, there's the Green Lane Corridor, which is uh, slated for some higher density. I believe some of that could be designated for more affordable housing in a certain portion. Um, as far as seniors' residents go, in my current position, I'm actually working on a project to bring some affordable senior housing to our, the community that I work for. Um, uh, so we've been talking with uh, developers that deal with seniors properties and uh, something's going to happen soon. Uh, and I know Bradford's done a study and, and they've built a beautiful seniors complex up there just recently. Thank you. I have an opinion and that is when I travel around, especially how landing around other areas in East Gilmery, does it look like there's a lack of affordable housing? especially when they're putting out monster homes in Sharon. If, uh, as, as Cal has mentioned, I think there has to be some kind of coordination between the federal government, Liberal Trudeau, with the Conservatives now for and how that interacts with municipal players. Because, as mentioned, we have a corridor that's coming up that's going to be along Green Lane. That may be an area where we can put affordable housing in, but it has to be conversation and there has to be dialogue with the public. Um, the question was asked, what more could the municipality do? And uh, tagging on to uh, what my colleague down there was saying about the different levels of government, I think one thing we can do is to be looking at development charges for affordable housing. We need to keep our development charges high to be able to bring in the services that, that our growing community needs, but at the same time to give uh, a, a pass for someone who's building affordable housing and to work with our partners. The school board has development charges that, that apply to new houses as well as um, the region. So working with, with those uh, other levels of government uh, to talk about bringing development charges down specifically to be able to bring affordable housing in and to work with our partners at the provincial government and federal government to get support for that I think would be a very uh, well thought through plan. Thank you. I think we also have to look at, and I've heard this by also knocking on doors, the density issues. And in my, just around the corner from where I live, there used to be a school on School Street. And that now has a new kind of infill sub, little subdivision. I'm kind of wondering when I was one of people walking around there, why those people got those particular, you know, they bought in those homes, but we have to pay for additional services. So I'm kind of wondering what kind of thought process went into those kind of density decisions, because those can't be the density decisions moving forward. 
Any other rebuttals? Uh, for the next question, we'll start with Count, just so we can get spare. What improvements would you suggest? Sorry, what improvements can you suggest for the revitalization of the downtown area of Holland Lane? That's part of my platform is to uh, revitalize downtown Holland Lane. I know if any of you live in that area, it's become quite neglected. The roads are crumbling, the sidewalks are horrible. Um, and, and I've worked on such initiatives before. Uh, we need to, through zoning changes, we can bring in better development there. We can bring in some streetscaping and uh, bring it back to the historical aspect that it, that, sh that it should have. Terry? So downtown Hall and Landing, uh, I don't believe it's in horrible shape. Uh, that gas station at Young and Bradford Street is certainly ugly, but that has probably been taken out of the hands of the municipality. I would assume that uh, there's environmental concerns there. I know that there's some property on the east side of Main Street, south of Bradford, that I believe uh, is ready to, uh, zoning may have already been changed to, re to uh, retail, I'm not too sure. But I know a lot of those people have been approached about selling their homes. Uh, it, it's going to look a whole lot different shortly as, uh, when they start building those, uh, those retail outlets. So. I'm not so sure what other changes uh, are going to make a big difference without really impacting your tax plan. Thank you. Um, reunification of uh, downtown Hall Landing is something that I also have on my platform. Um, I, to me, it would look like um, enforcing the property standards. So uh, when my colleague here says there's nothing the municipality can do, we can enforce our property standards. I noticed the weeds are knee high in the sidewalk, so it was one of the things I brought up when I met with our CAO to say, why can't we do something about that? Our own property standards on our own land. And he pointed out that that party on the street is regional, but that if council wanted, we could spend uh, the extra money to send in our uh, crews to make sure that that area gets cleaned up better. So to me, it's things like planters and uh, um, benches and uh, banners and, and, and street lights that look nicer. I don't think it would cost a lot of money, but it would give us a sense of community and uh, connecting the sidewalks would be another thing so that people uh, can walk there and that will attract businesses. Thank you. The downtown area of Holland Landing, um, beyond the cosmetics that you can do, I think one of the driving forces that's got to bring people down there is how does how does transportation interact with that downtown area? How do we bring down more YRT? How do we bring down Go, for example, to access people so they can get off and then go to the local store? How do how are we interacting with business owners to say, hey, instead of going to the box store up at Green Lane and Young, are you coming down to Holland Landing? Because people actually want to shop locally. That's one of the things that, that drove people to Holland Landing. Any rebuttals? Okay, thank you. For the next question, we'll start with Terry Foster. This is for all, uh, pretty much I think all questions for all, all candidates. Council has received a variety of salary surveys from surrounding and similar sized municipalities that point out a reduced salary might be in order. Will you accept a lower salary? <laughs> Great question. We don't even know what the job's about yet. Most of us up here and you're asking us to take less money. Um, I would be willing to take less money if, if uh, some other employees in the town take less money because they've been getting the raises the same as council has. Thank you. Uh, to me, representing uh, my community is not about the money. I stepped forward to be a public school trustee uh, right after my CARES had slashed trustee salaries to $5,000 a year. When I started, it was a full-time job, and my babysitter made more money than I did. Um, 
so I'm not in this for the money. At the same time, my first principle is about respecting the tax dollar. I want you to get value for your money, so whether we're paid what's the existing rate or something lower, I want to make sure that you feel that you're getting value for your money. Um, with the ward system, it's new, and people are saying, therefore, we should cut back on the salaries because of the ward system. To me, the ward system is about you having more representation, uh, for you having more, um, and for us having more oversight. So I think that more counselors doesn't mean that a smaller workload. I think it means that there's more that we can do. And again, in our discussions with the CAO, he talked about uh, counselors being able to take on more responsibility. So I think it's up to uh, the constituents. Thank you. I have had this question asked uh, numerous times when I've uh, knocked at doors, and my basic response is this. How the situation was handled by having the question actually come out of the council, if I actually, actually I was sitting there, I would have not taken part of the vote. I do believe, however, that the general public in, Hall, in Ward 1 or even East Gilbert wants us to take lower salaries, and that should be a referendum question attached to the election. If the, if this overwhelming demand that councillors were reduced to 39,000, let the public decide. It should not be for councillors to decide. I think it, on the face of it, and when we compare it to other municipalities, maybe we do get paid too much, maybe councillors do get paid too much. Uh, I think we have to consider that um, when, that we as electors and citizens have to ask our councillors how much they're working for us in the public sector, in the private sector, you know, people are paid what they're worth, what they produce. I'm here to run as a full-time counselor, not as a part-time counselor, not as a retirement thing. You know, I'm not going to run for any other office, so I'm here to be a full-time counselor. Thank you. Thank you. Any rebuttals? Um, my colleague John said that uh, if he was on council, he would take part in the vote. It's actually uh, something that we are supposed to do. It's the same thing. Uh, being a school board trustee, uh, we actually voted on, on our own uh, raises once uh, the new government lifted the um, cap that Harris had imposed. It is awkward, but it's in the Act uh, for trustees in the Education Act. It's something that you have to do. So sometimes you have to do things that do make you uncomfortable, but you do the best that you can. The biggest part of this for me is that we need to stop navel gazing about our own salary and start thinking about the issues that are important to you. And when I see that the council has spent so many meetings discussing their own salary, it worries me because I know we have other things we need to do. So pay us a few thousand dollars less, keep it the same, whatever uh, you want, let's move on to the issues that actually matter to our community. Thank you. Um, I just want to make sure that people understand this. Well, I am I am retired as of June 29th, 2018, but I will be taking on this job full time. I'm not going to treat it as a part time job. But I also want to get to the issue of why I said I wanted to you know, abstain from voting. There are some issues councillors can abstain from voting on, and, and I want to test drive this with people in the community. They seem to have no trouble with that. So. Again, if that's what the general public wants, then they can vote it in. I mean, this is what elections are for. And, you know, again, I believe in transparency. And one thing that I have dealt with over the last couple of years here at the election is the lack of transparency, especially when it comes to certain organizations here in your region. Thank okay, this will be the last question before the closing uh, comments. Uh, and we'll start, uh, I guess we'll go back to starting with Jen. With regards to this municipality's governance, do you believe that greater accountability and transparency are required? Short answer, yes. Uh, transparency is an interesting um, kind of screening to what actually the taxpayers, the voters in East Coast are one. Um, and going back to this whole issue of why should you know the, the chair of the be 
elected. I think it should be elected. Governance is a two-way street. It's top-down and it's bottom-up. And I, you know, I believe fully in grassroots, where people at the bottom level, residents decide these issues, and they push the issues higher up the food chain. They have to meet along the way with federal, provincial, regional. And that, that governance is, uh, can only be achieved through dialogue and understanding of what the issues are. During, while walking around the community and talking to people, I think the perception out there is that uh, our town council is basically rubber stamping everything that goes through. That I don't know if that's true or not, but uh, that is sort of the perception of their residents. So I think uh, we need more accountability. We need counselors that are out there talking to people, people that are uh, counselors that are calling people back and discussing issues, getting community involved, setting up community associations. Holland, I don't believe has anything like that right now. I think it's getting the residents more involved in what's going on in their community. And that will bring better transparency. There certainly needs to be accountability and transparency, but I, I have to say that uh, the current council and past councils, I, I don't believe they have not been accountable and, and transparent about a lot of things. Um, I don't remember anything really horrible coming out that past councillors or uh, the mayors have done. Um, so. Frankly, you need to be able to talk to people. You need to be able to give them some answers. Uh, I don't necessarily believe that things are being rubber stamped, although uh, that does come up. Uh, but I, I think it's time for a change and some new ideas. And quite frankly, with the ward system the way it is now, you're going to get change and some new ideas in Ward 1. Thank you. I think this is a great question. And anyone who was following our school board in the Toronto Star saw that we had a number of issues with transparency and accountability. And that's why I stepped up to be chair. Um, when I became a trustee, I had no interest in being chair. I wanted to represent my own ward. Um, but when we started having problems around transparency and accountability, that's when we saw the trust uh, fall off. When you lose trust, it's very hard to then try and be accountable and transparent because no one believes you. So it was a long journey, it was exhausting, but we turned things around uh, by being more open, by having the trustees going out into the community and talking with people, um, by live, so we were working on live streaming our board meetings. Um, there's a number of things that we can do to prove that. And the most important thing is ensuring that as counselors, we don't have communications behind the scenes, on the phone, on the email, in the uh, back room, that the decisions are made in public so that people hear your process of thinking things through. If you're calling staff and asking questions outside the board meeting, people don't know the answers that you're getting. Thank you. Three minutes. Okay, and we will proceed with closing. And closing is two minutes, and we'll start with the normal brothers. Thank you again for your participation in our democratic process and to the Chamber for organizing this great event. I'm running to ensure our town remains affordable with a quality of life that is second to none. I want to use my experience in business in managing the school board's $1.5 billion budget to ensure that we keep taxes low and deliver the programs and services our residents deserve. Please don't hesitate to reach out to me on Facebook or by visiting my website, lauralee.ca. And on October 22nd, Please vote Dorothy Carruthers for Ward 1. Thank you so much. Again, thank you for the opportunity. This has been an experience. I've never done uh, uh, this uh, political thing before in this type of, uh, of a situation. Uh, all I can say is please take the time to uh, meet the candidates in all the wards. Uh, I believe you're going to find out more about those candidates when you talk to them one on one than you ever will in this type of an event. Um, and again, on October the 22nd, or at the uh, advanced polls, uh, please consider me, Terry Foster, when you're voting in Ward 1. Thank you. If elected, some of the areas I will be advocating for is to better manage growth. Uh, we need to improve our daily commutes, which 
which is one of the longest now in the GTA. Uh, we need to make areas around school zones safer for our children. We need to improve overall pedestrian safety and accessibility, particularly for our seniors and disabled. And we need to protect the heritage that we have here in Home Landing and River Drive Park. I have that hands-on experience of working on these initiatives, a proven track record of achieving results. Now I want to do it for my community. To say we are experiencing rapid change in East Bonner is an understatement, but I truly believe this is the time to take a new approach. We live in a beautiful community, but going forward, we have the potential to make it something special. Something different from the status quo that we see in surrounding communities like Markham and Vaughan. Growth may be inevitable, but we must find a way to moderate it. We must ensure the preservation of our green space and the distinctive, distinctive character of our community. With your support, my goal is to bring the experience and knowledge I have gained to work for you and our great community. So on October 22nd, I ask for your support. Um, um, thank you. I too would like to uh, thank the East Columbia Chamber of Commerce for being on this event. It's the first time I've ever taken an event like this, so it was a steep learning curve to come up here. And I also have to really appreciate the comments and the willingness of the other candidates here. And I think all of you sitting up here at the front of the round, big round of applause for taking part. It's hard when you get in front of a microphone and speak to, we start off maybe 25 or 50, maybe you have 75 or 100 now. I am Jeremy Smith, I am running for Ward 1 Councillor. I am deeply vested in this community. I really want to see some improvements along the way, especially when it comes to transportation. I have been knocking on doors and people are saying, as um, one candidate has already said, Transportation is an issue, especially when you go east-west. We have to commute, improve commute times. We have to get around, from where I live, around the airport. We have to get through Sharon to 404, the bathrooms, those type of things. So when I come to your door, please don't hesitate to strike up our conversation. I look forward to seeing a lot of you when I knock on your doors. And please remember to vote for Jeremy Smith on October 27th. 22nd. Thank you. Thank you, Board One candidates. So, if we increase quickly switch, we'll move right on to Board Two. We are not taking breaks tonight. We're trying to get this all done.
I respect your tax dollars. And over the last eight years, we have eliminated the town's debt and put millions in reserves. Tax increases have been held at or close to the rate of inflation, and we actually have the lowest relative taxes in your region. In fact, they are 19% lower than the York Region average on a detached two-story home. And while I have been delivering on my promise of fiscal responsibility, we have been delivering services for our residents. We implemented 24-7 firefighter coverage, expanded library services, and built a recreational infrastructure like the new skate park in Hall Landing, over 29 kilometers of new trails, and acquired 16 acres of service land for our new pool and community facility in Queensville. We've won awards for our projects and have been recognized as a top employer. This election, you'll be selecting four new players for the council team. If elected, I will be able to help bridge the transition and provide continuity with an understanding of where we have been and a vision for where we are going. I work hard to listen to every concern, bring people together and find solutions. Our municipality is well positioned to face the challenges ahead. The tremendous growth in our communities has brought a great many new people to our town, whether they have come from down the street or around the world. We need to continue to continue to build on the great work that we have started. I love our town and I'm proud of our accomplishments. You have elected me twice to be your voice on council, and I would be honored to continue to work on your behalf. Thank you for considering me for councillor to work too. My name is Joe Chichini. Sorry about that. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to thank the Chambers for uh, putting this event through and Stefan, Stefan for hosting this event. And, and I also welcome all the new candidates to be. I'm seeking re-election in East Glenbury Municipal Council. I have been a councillor for, for the past four years, worked hard on behalf of all those who live and work in the communities. East Rollerberry has been my home since 2007. I see how important the community is to everyone who lives here and clearly sees how decisions are made in all politics level impact the community. For 38 years, I've been a successful business owner and, and the community and organizer. As an organizer of many fundraising events and raising millions of dollars to benefit the community projects which I am remain passionate about. It. Some of the accomplishments is $3.5 million raising for ACC kids, $1.8 million for South Lake Hostel to rebuild the division of their pool. And I continue on to do the Joe Christian Charity Way every year, just to name a few. I am committed to promoting sustainability to community growth. I strive to ensure the decision making that recognizes the voice of the stakeholders in the communities. I have strong business and community values. I'm able to establish and maintain quality partnership that needs building safe and support community for everyone. As a chair of the police service, as I was chair of police service before in partnership, I have been able to achieve efficiency and benefit the taxpayers in East Glenberry. And Sorry, and the main thing is the service facilities for new families, youth, and senior, seniors. Everyone deserves an accommodate no matter what age needs to be had, or strategy, planning, and council acknowledge, and have plan to play into work and partnership to provide the best community of all. Being a member of the service, your police police service for eight years, and vice chairman for four, and first hand knowledge about how ensure the safety of the community, understand how the value of the safety of the needs, advocate to ensure how they can be best met. Listening to you, getting done, things done is very important to me. I strive to build a vibrant and progressive community. We have a strong team at East Road Bear and really proud of Richard Council, support service and local business. I'm a, it's important to me to build a strategy that creates a community which meets the needs of our citizens. Thank you very much. Thank you to the Chamber of Commerce for putting together this meet your candidates now. My name is Ira Costa. Just a brief history about myself. My husband's family farmed in Princeville from the 1950s until the late 1980s. 
In fact, many long-time residents still remember the Costa farm and the Costa family members. Our fond memories of the farm drew us back to live in this community. And here I am now, running for counselor for Ward 2. What am I offering to be your counselor? I have over 20 years of experience working in a nonprofit organization. I am passionate about my work. First, I coordinate our charitable foundations, which provide all kinds of medical equipment in hospitals, clinics, fire departments. I also coordinate youth programs, encouraging students to write poems, compete in our poster competition, public speaking, and our video competitions. My organization also provides bursaries to students who are children and grandchildren of veterans. Parents, you know how much it costs to send your students or your children to universities nowadays. Third, and this is the best part of my job, serving our military men and women, our veterans. Because of my organization, veterans are getting disability pensions. Those who are at risk of being homeless are getting financial assistance for rent, for food, for medical equipment so that they can start their life again. We have a new program called Service Dogs for Veterans and they are meant for the ill and injured veterans and those who develop mental illness because of what they've seen in the war. I get really emotional whenever I talk about our veterans because I know how much they appreciate the services we provide. And I'm part of that organization and I'm, I'm proud that I have made a difference in their lives. With experience in the banking industry, legal profession, and nonprofit organization, I offer a well-rounded experience to the council table, which I believe is what's needed on council right now. I want to serve this community, and I would like to extend the same enthusiasm and passion I have for my work as a counselor. Folks, you are here tonight because you care, and I also care, and I'm just like you, and I hear your concerns. I want to provide opportunities for us to be healthy and active, for our seniors to be able to stay in the community they love. I like to see some apartments built for young couples and singles who cannot afford to buy a house. I want to expand on youth programs and volunteer run programs which bring us all together. I want a community safer and clearly the world needs to be well managed and spending and our property taxes under control. For the first time, Winston and Sharon residents, you are going to choose who you want to represent you in World 2. And I am a strong advocate for people's need. I have a proven record for making a difference in people's lives, young and old. Residents of Queens and Sharon, choose to make a difference. Choose me as a counselor, as your counselor. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we're now going to move ahead with the questions uh, which were submitted. The, uh, again, one minute answer, and then each candidate has a chance to do a up to one minute rebuttal. Um, for the audience, and you guys who were here earlier, some of the questions are repetitive because people submitted it from each ward. We will start with uh, Tara, Roy de Clemente, for the first question. Just to warn you, we're going to alternate the people answering the question. I am deeply concerned by the speeding and dangerous driving I see on McCowan on a regular basis. What do you intend to do to make it safe to walk, check the mail, or ride on a bike on our local roads? Well, we've already tried to do some certain things uh, to address that. I think you, you, your question mentioned McCowan, but I think if you name a street, any street, any school and bury it there, are people who are concerned about traffic safety on those roads. Um, ultimately, it's council's decision on how, uh, what the speed limit needs to be, and it needs to be in partnership with our police force to do that enforcement. And there are some mechanisms in place to address 
those um, uh, go to some programs in the provincial police to help address that. There's our road watch program where you can file a report. There's uh, the ability to call in and ask the, the police to uh, address a certain area of concern, and we've done that. Uh, we also have the opportunity to put up speed boards and collect data so that we can submit that to IRP so that they know when the speeding is taking place. And I believe that uh, there's a lot, of, it's a huge issue. I don't have it, but one minute isn't quite enough to address it. Thank you, Mr. Klein. Same thing? Well, as a matter of fact, I've had this gentleman in the audience who can see me, but, uh, also from the community of This is a big, uh, complicated uh, issue. Sometimes uh, the speeders are the ones who live in the area, and we have mounted the police, we have uh, uh, put speed limits uh, down, and still sometimes it doesn't work. So I think it's important that uh, the stakeholders, we all get together, and kind of work together on a solution because it's very, very complicated. And uh, as uh, Tara said, it's not an easy thing, but we have to all work together so, and try to get the best thing to neighborhood watch or whatever we can do to make it safe. But as I say, most of the time there are people who are, who are living in the community and there's young people that are actually speaking. So just, this is a big problem everywhere. I do agree with Tara and Joe. However, people, when you see something happening on the street, please report it right away to the police. Report the, the, the problems, report the issues right away to your council so that they could all be solved slowly but surely. And these are concerns. Safety is a big concern in our community. We have to protect our kids. We have to protect our seniors walking on the streets. So please, people, when you see something not working on the street, I advise your counsel. Thank you. Rebuttal? Not so much a rebuttal as it is just a few more thoughts that I had since I went first. And one was the uh, a program that we started as a pilot project uh, with, uh, in, in partnership with YRP uh, and our town state roads department, which is a caution watch for children program. And so uh, you can sign up for a sign to be hosted on your front lawn. In fact, I put one on my street, on my front lawn, and my road was opened up for me, a dead-end street to a road that connected out to a regional road. And the other thing is to invest in our trails. If we can attract people onto our trails, get them out of their cars and into our trails, and act as far as active transportation, so getting from Holland Landing down to the GO station without ever having to get into your car, then that will also address some of those issues. So an active transportation community is important too. Um, Stefan, in my old community in Stoga, they have what you call community watch, and the members are retired men and women, and these men and women get together and discuss what's the problem with the community. I think I'd like to start that in Princeville. Thank you. I think there could also be a better way if, uh, if we have a neighbor's watch, and if, uh, we can take, start taking driver's license number and start reporting to the police. Maybe. It will stop some of the people. I mean, the fines should be a little bigger, on the, especially on the school zone. And, uh, you know, we're always coming up. I think we need to get the stakeholders involved and figure out ways, you know, you know get down to the root of the, of the problem and, and even address the problem. All right, the next question, again, for all candidates. Are you concerned that the election of the region chairman has been stopped? What can you tell us about democracy? If the most influential position in New York in the region is appointed, not elected. Oh, sorry, we'll start with it. Democracy, everybody knows what that means. People elect a certain person to represent their interest in the community. We have to have democracy in the system. That's all I'm saying. I guess I have mixed feelings. Uh, I mean, because the way it was handled is it moving too fast, and one day they're doing it, be elected, and the next time it you know, was, was done unfair. So I think it's, uh, that was not very uh, brought out the right way, in my personal feeling. So maybe this time around it'll be this way. It worked for all, all these years, and it can work again. But eventually I can just see this 
um, the city of York region happen in the next 10 years. And it's going to happen, so, uh, and it's going to be drowned. And I think, it, you know, like, uh, it, uh, as I said, it's, it's a mixed feelings. Uh, one way, uh, I'd like to have you liked it, but the way it was done and handled, and I didn't agree with it because, you know, you, you, one minute you got one decision, another minute it's a flip flop. That's my decision. Well, I'm concerned, deeply concerned. In fact, I, I consider it to be a perversion of our democratic rights. 43% um, of our property tax dollars go to York Region. We have one voice at that table. I was uh, encouraged by the fact that with an elected chair that we might have further accountability as taxpayers in East Wollongbury. With one voice at the regional, at the regional level, uh, it's easy for our voice to be drowned out by those of the, from the municipalities to the south. The uh, bill that was passed by the province had all party support. It wasn't a partisan issue whatsoever. And it was an, 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 a way for us to have greater accountability at the regional level. And uh, I am deeply dis disappointed in the situation. Any rebuttals? Uh, in a way, it, I agree with her, but I also, it was just the way it was done, that I disagree. So, thank you. An appointed region officer has their own agenda, where an elected officer will have all the concerns of the residents in the town. That's what I'm saying. Thank you. All right. Next question. Is there any thought to eliminating the train horns at our crossings now that they all have arms and legs. And we'll start with Joe. I kind of like those horns, the noise. Actually, like those new ones were even better. Uh, I have a friend of mine who lives in the, the next to the rail track in Newmarket. He says, I don't even hear it anymore. So I, I, I think we should still keep it for the safety of the people. Uh, double safe is better than no safe at all. Uh, there has been a lot of it. Uh, we've been approached by, uh, by residents. Um, the challenge becomes that Metro Lakes, um, they, will, uh, they will look at eliminating the horns, but any liability for any collision or any accident that takes place at those crossings then becomes the municipality's liability. And uh, from my perspective, I was not willing to assume that risk. Uh, that might be that the taxpayers in East Bullenberg would be exposed to those train horns have, for, have a purpose. Uh, the worry that I have or the concern that I understand people have is that as Metro Lakes adds to the service, which we want, we want more trains, that also means more horns. So we have to figure out uh, some way to last one. Maybe it's just one horn instead of three. Uh, but it, uh, it, certainly is a, it, it certainly is an issue. Amen. I love those coaching guards, ladies and men. They are mostly retired people. And it's one way for them to get out there in the community and see the kids, see the people, socialize. So I will support for them to stay. I like them. Thank you. Any thoughts? Next, the next question. We are the last community on the route downtown to maintain the horns. Oh, sorry, that's the same question. <laughs> <laughs> that's enough on the horns. Uh, with regards to this municipality's governance, do you believe that greater accountability and transparency is required? We'll start with Tara. I would love to hear from, um, from a resident who feels that, um, at least from my own performance, uh, that I have not been accountable or transparent in any decision making that I've made. I've been very open about the decisions I've made, why I've made those decisions. I've been consistent throughout the eight years I've been on council. If there's something more that people would like us to do, um, I would be happy to uh, find a way to make that happen. Uh, we are live streaming our council meetings coming this next term. 
and I've posted, in fact, when I post my voting record, it ends up being that I post everybody else's voting record as well because it's a recorded vote. So I'm doing that out of my own, uh, in my own steam. But I'd love to hear if there's something more that can, that can be done. Jeff, I think it's important to have transparency and uh, accountability. And uh, what we, we're going in the right direction to have the streaming, and so people can actually view it. And uh, must if you say something that you didn't say, if you say that, it's all on live stream. I also know that uh, every time I go to work, I make, do my best I can to, to think like my own business. I treat it like my own business. The decision we make is right like you're running your own business. It's important to me that the decision we make is always the best decision for, for the people and everyone around us because we, we don't then we obviously the tax dollars go up. As a councillor, you are legally bound to do things properly. If I get elected, I will ensure that I will always pay attention to the town budgets, sewer, garbage, road construction, new developments, bylaws, and other issues that affect our residents. I want to make sure I always deal with the public, and I want to make sure that I hear the concern, because that's the only way that you could make a very informed decision. Thank you. Rebuttals? Uh, thank you for that uh, rebuttal for the answers. But I don't think, I don't think people who never run before Realizes until I, I was one of those people that when I, before I got into council, I thought I could change the world. Boy, oh boy, it sure is not that way. You really have to work with all your counselors. So people sometimes they sit here and say, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. Trust me, you're not doing anything because you got to work with your peers. you gotta, you got to really make the decision with, along with everyone. So there's no way that I can do this, I can do that. No way, you have to work as a team and pull the wagon together so we can succeed. Yeah. You are not required to do major, major changes on your first term as counselor. What the people expected are for you to do little changes slowly that will affect the residents. Yes, sir. On the tower, you have a rebuttal left if you want to have um, When I ran in 2010 and 2014, it was an at-large system. And I often got asked at the doors, who else should I vote for? I like you, who else should I vote for? Because who would I work well with? And um, I think that part of the reason we're all here and we're all doing all candidates, it's not just one word or another. But as a community, you have to pick a team. And that's how I refer to it in my speech. It's four new members of the team that have to be working together for the betterment of our community. Thank you. Next question. Do you support enacting a residential tree by law to restrict private landowners from altering or removing trees on their property? And we'll start with Ada. I do not. I don't like the municipal government telling me what to do with my own trees. I planted that trees. I could do whatever I want to do with that trees. So, no, I do not believe in that. The municipal government has no right to imprint on the private property rights. No, I do not support it. No. I guess it depends what the tree is, if the tree is sick or whatever it may be. Uh, but I believe that if there's a good reason, since I've been in the government for four years, uh, the government doesn't come in and interfere with you in the first place unless there's a reason that, that they should. And, and, and I always like to know the reason why they want to do that. So. I feel that uh, unless I know uh, why they want to be in the kind of tree, uh, I need to know more about it before the decision. It could be a right decision, it could be a wrong decision. Our natural heritage is um, important. And uh, I did support a tree bylaw. That was something that I was asked by my constituents to bring forward as an issue. 
mainly because there were and there have been many instances of absolutely beautiful properties with great big huge trees that contributed to an appealing streetscape that everybody enjoyed that were basically being clear cut. And they were not being clear cut because the trees were ill or that they were a danger or that they were a nuisance. They were being clear cut for no good reason. And uh, there are uh, municipalities across this province that have effective tree bylaws where they, uh, they put in place a mechanism where if a tree is a certain size, then it needs to be assessed. And so uh, I, was, uh, I was in favor of examining what kinds of tree bylaws we could potentially put in place. So I advocated for one, uh, but we have not passed one, and we're going to get uh, some examples from staff on what best practices are. Rebound. I don't understand. Why do we need to go see an arborist in, for them to tell us that our tree is sick or dying? It doesn't take, it takes common sense when you see your tree losing the leaves, the roots being dry, the tree is dying. Why do I have to spend money for an arborist to come down and tell me, you have to get rid of your tree? I cannot support this bylaw. I'm very sorry. Thank you. Either of you want to rebut? We don't have a draft bylaw at this point to consider, and we don't have a mechanism about whether or not people have to spend money to have a tree assessed. Um, at this point, we are simply looking at the matter to say, how can we protect the natural heritage that is of, that is of importance to all of us? If we cut down all the trees, then we have nothing left to appreciate. So um, really what it comes down to is finding a balance between the rights of individual property owners, the rights of, uh, of everybody in the municipality to, to uh, have a natural heritage that they can appreciate, that the appealing streetscapes are maintained. That's what we love about this town, is how green it is. So let's find a way to protect it, but also to also respect the rights of individual property owners. Okay, next question. Do you support a heritage district designation for the core area of Sharon? And we'll start with a joke. I do. I, uh, I'm hoping that when we do uh, the rebuilding of our areas and, and uh, try to keep the, the uh, Sharon village just like uh, another unit to, uh, and protect the uh, and kind of sort of by about, you know, the, our master plan that we're going to be doing in the next little while has a lot of great ideas and we're moving forward and excited for hopefully that we'll take it like to, to be part of that. There's a lot of heritage and, that we want to keep and uh, people really like that and things go sometimes go out of hand. People build bigger places. We have to find two things that do. everything goes with, you know, trade the bylaws so hopefully that uh, everybody stays in the same uh, areas and build beautiful and Sharon keeps it safe. Sharon Village. Tara? Absolutely. Uh, it's been something that I've been pushing for uh, for quite some time. There were some studies that needed to be taken that needed to be done and be implemented. It's certainly on my list for the next term of council. Um, not only did a uh, heritage designation for the core of Sharon, but also for Queensville. There are some beautiful properties and some really unique places in both of those downtown cores that need to be protected and enhanced. Um, I can certainly say and share uh, residents' concerns about what I refer to as the mansions that are being put up. So individual little bungalows with great character are being torn down with um, properties that are being built that meet the current zoning standards at place. So a property, so a building permit does get issued, but we need to find a way to amend that so that we are protecting the unique character because if we don't protect where we, what we, where we were, then we're just going to end up with steel and glass and that's not what the character of our community is. Yeah. It depends. If people wanted a, this uh, heritage house beside the depot, that's fine. What about those people who doesn't want any of those besides your house? And I'm being practical here. See, you don't want your house to lose their value. Sometimes those heritage houses is better to put in another area where there are other heritage houses. And in this way, we could all visit those heritage houses and, and uh, observe how the people like them and everything. No, not a 
this time, I do not support Heritage House. Any rebuttals? Uh, no rebuttals, but I can say that uh, I'm excited. I look forward to see the, the, our master plan so we can get everything in. As Tara says, we'd like to fine tune you know, the bylaws so we can keep everything nice and neat. And we can make the Sharon Village and Queensville one of the nicest places to live and play. And I'm looking forward to that. Because there's a lot of opportunity. As I was campaigning the other day, I looked at the, the areas. It's a beautiful place to live and play. I said, geez, I like going to one of these houses over here. So we, were, we should be proud of East Goldberg. There's a house in the center of Queensville. It's right across the street from the public school. It's a fieldstone house. And the fieldstone house was built by hand by a farmer who took fields out of, who took stone out of fields while they were clearing the land to make farms. And they built a house out of it. And it is the most beautiful house you could ever imagine. And I'd like to see that protected so that other people can have the heritage and see where it came from. When I tell people when I'm from East Willowberry, I get a bit of a blank stare. What's a Willowberry and why is there two of them? And, uh, but then I say, have you ever heard of the Sharon Temple? Oh, I know where the Sharon Temple is. Well, if you know where the Sharon Temple is, then you need to realize that that's, part of, that's the heart of our community. You need to respect that. A heritage designation helps protect it. All right. Next question. This will be the last question before the closing statements. We'll start with uh, Tara answering the question, and the closing statements will start with Ada. Council has received a variety of salary surveys from surrounding and similar sized municipalities that point out a reduced salary might be in order. Will you accept a lower salary? The challenge becomes that with any other decision of council, if I were to be voting on anything else that, that affected my personal pocketbook, it would be a conflict of interest. And so uh, the job at this point was advertised at a certain rate of pay. And you can't change it in the midst of the application process. So council at this point has taken steps to move the decision out of our hands. We, during this last process, we also learned that most municipalities only have evening meetings. So your councillors could have a 9-to-5 job and still serve as a councillor. However, here in East Thornberry, we don't have that expectation. We expect that our councillors are available during the day. I will add that it hasn't been increased in at least two budget cycles. We have not raised those salaries at all. And I'll have a decision on this. I think, uh, no, I, I don't think, I know I agree with uh, Tara. Um, I think what we plan to do, uh, we can uh, um, point the next council, that's what my wishes are, that we appoint a special group of citizens to decide, they'll look at all the different pays in the York region and come up with some numbers. We can't give ourselves a raise, it sounds ridiculous. So let the committee, a special committee come out and set up a committee of business people or whatever and let them decide after of course looking at all the different pay scales and uh, we can decide and they can decide and then we can close the counts and we decide you know uh, and then we put it in effect uh, that's what i think the purpose of splitting the town in two words is to reduce and share the workloads between two councillors in the work. I believe councillors Marlene Johnston and Jamia motioned for their salary to reduce before, and uh, the three members of council opposed it. This issue should have been already decided at time, and now it's coming back after the election. Once elected, I was able to de determine if the workload is equal to the salary being paid for it. After all, serving the committee should be the main goal, and being paid for it is secondary. Thank you. Three Certainly. 
Uh, <laughs> at virtually every opportunity before the nomination period ended, um, the two individuals that were noted, one in particular, continued to advocate for a raise at every opportunity. Another one of those individuals uh, ensured that they were given a retroactive pay increase that went back 18 months while they were serving as a member of council. On this council, we have not done that. We have not voted ourselves significant pay raises. As a board of directors of millions of dollars, a municipality with worth millions of dollars, you expect professionals, you, you expect education, and you expect the people to respect your dollars. If something happens to our water, our drinking water system, your members of council can be held criminally responsible. So when I stay and stand here and say I want to be elected and serve you, I'm also saying that I'm going to ensure personally I could go to jail if I make the wrong decision, making your drinking water unsafe. I'm saying that I take that great, great, great responsibility for that. I take it seriously. And I hope that people who are sitting in this room realize that whatever amount, dollar amount that is, it's not it's not enough to, to really recognize the value for money that you're putting behind that vote when you're marking your own. Any other rebuttals? Well, All, right. All right, we will now proceed with the closing statements. You have two minutes each, starting with Katie. Thank you, Stefan. You did a marvelous job monitoring this event. And of course, thank you to the Chamber of Commerce for putting together, again, this Meet the Candidates Night. Thank you, everyone, for coming here, for taking it easy on me, especially the new candidates. The candidates all agree that this town is a great place to live and raise a family. Now, we should all agree that what we need are council members who are responsible, accountable, and approachable. When you go home tonight, think about that person who will represent you in your work. I enjoy meeting and talking with all of you. I'm having such a blast. My name is Ai Pasta, and I'm wishing you all good night. Thank you. Again, I'd like to thank all of you for coming out this evening. I am passionate and committed to working with you, serving you as Council East Gordonburg. Give me your vote and the privilege to serve you again. I promise you to work hard for each and every one of you. Experience counts and informing a member of East Gordonburg Council. I fully understand many needs, the challenges we must have ahead. Working with your counselor in the past four years, I realized all the needs, what we need to do. I will listen to each and every one of you I have done in the past and act on doing the right, the right of our, for the community. Recognizing the fiscal responsibility and desire to keep the community a safe and welcome place. I will continue to serve you well with the ones I've been asking. I stand here on my record and promise to continue to use my strong business experience, the community values when making decisions. I bring 33 years of experience, knowledge, and running a local business leader and support of many communities. For the past four years, I've given my extensive knowledge to understand how things get done in the local government. I will promote sustainability growth, maintain affordable taxes as one of the lowest rated in the region in line with the inflation. And it's intrinsically important that our growing diverse community to make decisions to recognize that all stakeholders' interests and needs. We establish and maintain positive and quality partnership with business, community, groups, and levels of government. With your quote, I will work hard and I have the expertise and knowledge and the passion to help you out. So vote for Joe Persichini. Thank you. Uh ask when we're going to get that pool. <laughs> so during my opening remarks, I outlined just a few of the accomplishments the town has had in the past years. But what comes next? Why should you vote for me this time? Aside from fighting to get that pool built, 
I have five reasons. Number one, I listen to residents, I take action, and I get results. Number two, I do my research, and I'm not afraid to ask the tough questions. Number three, I will continue building community through programming, special events, and facilities like an aquatic center, which is a fancy way of saying pool. Number four, I care about our economy and attracting good jobs to EG. Fifth, I understand firsthand the pressures of growth and, commit, and are committed to building safe, livable neighborhoods. So thank you to all of you for coming here tonight and listening. I want to take this opportunity to thank my fellow candidates, especially those, those here and up at the back of the room, um, for coming out and putting your name on that ballot. I know how much it takes and what you may be sacrificing in order to serve our community, and I salute you all. And to those of you in the audience, as we look to October 22nd, I'd like to encourage you to look for candidates who are enthusiastic and who can articulate a vision for a bright future for our town. Forward-thinking leaders who bring fresh energy and new ideas to help protect what we value in our town, attract a land investment, and cultivate a creative, healthy, green, and vibrant East Wilkesbury. We deserve nothing less. Thank you for your consideration on the 22nd. Thank you for All right, once again, there's no worry. We're quickly switching over. If we can uh, have the award three candidates come to the front, please. And while we're changing, I would like to thank very much all of the hard work by Kathy, our office administrator, and all of the uh, East Schoolbury Chamber of Commerce directors and volunteers who helped plan and put together this event. We will start with three minute introductions starting at this end with Melody. Then one minute questions followed by a chance for one minute rebuttal which you do not have to take. And then afterwards at the end will be a two minute closing. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to thank all of you for taking this time out tonight to come and listen to each and every one of the candidates from each ward and to get some information so that way you're more informed going forward for the next election. As has been mentioned, my name is Melody Somerville, and why am I here and why am I running for council? I'm running for council in Ward 3. It's really important because I believe in what the role of the municipal government is, is the basics. Making sure your taxes are low, your roads are looked after, your water, your sewage, your garbage. Those are the fundamentals of which our municipal government looks after. Our whole life in Mount Albert and in Ward 3 and in East Glenberry is based within our taxes and within our lifestyle. We want to make sure going forward in the next four years, it's affordable. As is mentioned in my bit in my platform, I'm trying to promote the idea of having a smart community growth, and that important part is growth. We do need the growth within East Philbury because in turn, those funds come back to infrastructure and help us to go forward. Also, it helps us with the highest standard of living because with those infrastructures and with regards to living ex expenses within our community, we want to be able to go forward. mentioned that it is only 70% within East Gulliver that is green space. And in Ward 3, that's important for us because our area will not be growing as much as what Ward 2 and Ward 1 will be growing. So where will our services will be directed? Over this way. Ward 3 is a very unique location. We are going to be sort of a little stagnant compared to the other parts here of growth, which is great. But again, our services, our taxes, are not going to be so much reflected, possibly, in the first little bit, except for War Two and War One. And some people are wondering why the water went up. That's a good question for a lot of people. The reasons are the development over here is to make sure that these new houses have water and sewage. And again, this goes back to our taxes. Our taxes are, in, are going up and our water's going up. 
I'd like to know why. I'd like to keep our lifestyles, again, back to the positive living experiences and with the highest standards of living within our community. I moved to Mount Melbourne 12 years ago, so that way my family can experience what I had. I grew up in Port Perry. I grew up in a small community. I grew up knowing my neighbors. I have friends here, I have neighbors here, I have people I've met through the years through this community. And because I've moved here over the years, I experience a positive lifestyle like what my children have as well as others as well too going forward. I believe that civic duty is the most esteemed and fulfilling a person can give. It's not just the position, but it's, the, it's also the community in which they serve. Thank you.
grow in a positive, fiscally responsible way. As a self-employed professional art raiser for locally, nationally, and internationally for the past 18 years, I have business experience in all facets of budgeting, hiring and firing, marketing, and providing the highest quality of customer service to my clients. I pride myself on the relationships that I have with other people and being an excellent communicator. Number two, as a small business owner of Home Support for Seniors, which I started two years ago, it's a companionship service that helps elderly loved ones live in their homes independently. I have seen firsthand the incredible need for support in senior communities. I started this business when my best friend's dad got cancer, her mom had a heart attack at the same time, and I stepped in and I, I noticed the difference, the extra set of hands, how it can make life easier and gives peace of mind. I've spoken with the stakeholders in the community, including Dr. Watley, the key doctor and care provider in our area, and former Ontario Medical Association president, about our community's most important health care needs. And he told me that it is long-term care beds. My goal is to champion the building of long-term care facility in Mount Albert and affordable housing for seniors. Three, as a dedicated volunteer my entire life, I've served on boards and community committees in various capacities with my many organizations. I'm a person who takes action. I'm currently an East Voluntary Library trustee and serving as the director of the Mount Albert Village Association Revitalization Committee. We're working together to beautify the town, make signage improvements, and look for ways to increase spending with local businesses. I intend to put Mount Albert on the map in a principled, respectful way. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Scott Crone, and I would like to be a new voice on East Willowbury Council. I love this town, and I've lived here for most of my life. In fact, the Crone family has lived here for over six generations. You, you could say that East Willowbury is in my DNA. Now, usually there are one of two reasons why people seek elected office. Either they have an axe to grind, or they are passionate about public service. I have no axe to grind. I am very excited and passionate when I can help people solve problems. And you know, an example of this is when the TD Bank decided to pull out of Mount Albert. And I got involved. And I wanted to solve that problem. My 20 years of corporate experience taught me how to dissect the problem and then fix it. I was glad to put my problem solving skills to use for the town. And then today, the Duke of Credit Union is a great addition to our community. And I was proud to have some small part in getting them there. I grew up on a farm, went to Mount Albert Public School. Later on, my folks, Murray and Ruby Crone, would start the Mount Albert Bakery. And I spent my formative years there working and learning about how small business works and getting involved with the community. In fact, I was a founding member of this Chamber of Commerce back then, in those early days, and I represented the bakery. I would work at the bakery and then earn my degree uh, from York University at the same time. For the past 20 years, I have worked in the insurance industry. I started at the bottom and I worked my way up to the position of Vice President. In my corporate experience, I have managed million dollar budgets. And as a member of the executive team, I was a steward of nearly half a billion dollars in capital and assets. I firmly believe that this corporate business experience qualifies me to look after your tax dollars. I now work as a consultant for the insurance and financial services industry. I have been blessed with a diverse range of experience working between Main Street and Bay Street, but I've always been proud to be from a small town. In my spare time, I sit as a volunteer board director of the Alzheimer's Society of York Region. And I have to tell you, this has been an immensely gratifying experience. I live in the country on the ninth line, and I'm happily married to my wife, Selena. We have a daughter, Kayla, along with two dogs, three chickens, and a horse. And I hope today we can talk about some of the issues that I am passionate about, such as community safety, reducing speed and crime in our community. I'm a champion of 
improving our broadband service, which is especially poor in the rural part of our community. And I am a fiscal conservative, and I want to talk about keeping our taxes low. As well, I would like to talk about keeping the small town feel that we have. I look forward to discussing issues ahead for you, and I welcome your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andy. Uh, I don't know whether this is because there is a lot of passion in Ward 3, or whether there's a lot of issues in Ward 3, but we have more questions for Ward 3 than the other two combined. So we won't get through them all. We're still doing the same time as everybody else. So if your question is in here and not asked, I'm kind of randomly picking them, so I apologize. I'll spend one second to, uh, I've been asked by the non Alpha Village Association, which is Ward 3, that to let you know that they also have a debate on October 10th at 7 p.m. in non Alpha Community Center. So perhaps these other questions that aren't asked today can come up at that point. I'm going to start, though, intentionally with a question everybody else has had, which is a salary question. I'm going to start with Melanie. Since everybody's had to answer this slightly uncomfortable question, I'll well give it to you as well since it's in the back end. Council has received a variety of salary surveys from surrounding similar sized municipalities that point out a reduced salary might be in order. Will you accept a lower salary? I believe that the base is 45, and then there's a car allowance of five, or a car payment. To me, I think the car payment should be nullified. If you reduce the payment of the salary of the counselor, the question that I have to ask is, do they have to submit in receipts to get reimbursed for expenses that they have to incur? So is it cost effective or is it more uh, not productive at all? I do think that uh, it is defined at 45,000 if it's a full-time position that they should receive that full amount. Okay. When I first start, when I started on council the first time, the very first year, um, we made twelve thousand dollars, and we had many, many communities and or committees, and we had lots of jobs. The first increase the council voted themselves, which I voted against, was in 2003, and I am quite willing to take a cut. I do not expect to be making any more money than what they already have, or even a lower amount. Susan? I'm open-minded, and I believe that you are voting for individuals who are able to make tough decisions in an objective and unbiased way. And so in that, uh, in those circumstances, um, it would be one of the first tough decisions that we had to make, uh, but one that we should be willing to uh, compromise on. I'm open-minded. I'm open-minded to hearing all the different perspectives and the studies that have been conducted. And currently, I sit on a board and uh, as a volunteer and where we discuss these salaries, and they are much higher than what a town council makes in terms of the board that I sit on. So I think that you pay as a principal for the quality of the people that you have working for you, and you should keep that in mind in terms of getting value for your vote with professionals who are conducting their business in a professional, respectful way. Thank you. Okay, so here's, here's how I look at this. First of all, I, I happen to believe that voting on your own pay is an inherent <coughs> conflict of interest. When I was a, a vice president of a, of a corporation, we never voted on our own pay increases. That was decided by a separate body. So I think there's, there's a conflict there. And I've, I've recommended that, um, that, in fact, that before, I should say that uh, it's a conflict even for the town staff be making recommendations or compiling uh, suggestions on how council should be paid. They're put in an awkward position. So I would recommend in advance that uh, I would either go with a, a consultant who specializes in, in compensation or even a private citizens committee to look at this and uh, provide options. But we should not be uh, deciding on that as a council. Uh, I'm not doing this for the pay. Uh, you know, I love public service. 
But I, I would say that you, if you make it too low, you get what you pay for. You pay peanuts and you will attract monkeys. We now have the option of a one minute rebuttal if any of you wants to take it. Kathy? I have to disagree with the fact that um, if the salary is lower, yet you do not get the um, class of, of council members that you wish to have. Um, I worked with, with, with good councillors and um, it didn't, re it didn't uh, reflect on how we did our job or how we dealt with our residents or the issues. And um, I don't believe that by lowering the uh, income in the next uh, council session will make any difference. And if I can say a few more words to this uh, point, it, the, it is critical to have professional uh, individuals who view this as a full-time job that, that they are completely committed to and not a part-time job or a hobby. And um, I have volunteered countless hours for which I was not paid and I would continue to run as a counselor despite the fact that this is an open issue. I think it's a very obvious situation, but as I said before, you're voting for people who need to make tough decisions, and if we are in the decision of a position of making decisions, then we should be um, allowed that opportunity. I don't necessarily feel that we need to hire outside consultants and spend money on outside consultants. I think in a transparent system that we can make effective decisions even on tough decisions. Uh, yeah, I, I would just like to add that, you know, folks, Terry made a very good point earlier on. This is an important role where we're all criminally liable if bad things happen. It's not a charity. You want to attract good people here. And not everyone here at this table can, has other revenue streams. You know, some people have pensions that they can draw on. You know, that's great. But I think you need to be equitable in how you treat people, especially your elected officials. It's very, it's very in vogue to kick politicians in the shin and, and go after them. But I don't think it's fair, because if we do a good job, I, I don't expect to be treated and compensated fairly. I'm not saying I will take a lower, I, I, I'd quite happily take a lower uh, pay. I'm not doing it. I'm not doing this for the money. But I'm still not doing this as a charity either. Thank you. I agree with regards to what uh, Susan said, and that is this has been voted on. It's been considered and it's been passed. Forty-five thousand dollars for a base income, and as I said, if you take a if you take a deduction, I know that you have to submit in receipts. I know you have to show what your expenses are, and you ask for you ask for repayment back. It's going to balance it at the end. If the forty-five thousand dollars is what you're giving with everything in, minus the car payment, I don't think that bringing in outside groups to pay taxes on top of that to pay for that is worth it. So I think again, my point is, if you're full time at forty-five thousand, I think you're worth it. Sorry, second rebuttal. No, just one second rebuttal. Very good. Then we move on to the next question. When, uh, sorry, this time we're going to start with Scott and come back this way. Okay. Uh, when will major improvements to the downtown core of Mount Albert be done? We have seen very little happen even though there is existing funding. That is an excellent question. Uh, I would like to see more. We've, we've started uh, some, uh, when I say we are in the town, uh, I started some recently. We've got some plans to so has been a bit of a a revitalization there, uh, but there is so much more we need to do. The downtown is, it's, it needs a facelift. It, it, it's looking tired. You know, we need to make it a place where business wants to come to. Because if you make it attractive, you'll attract business, but if you don't invest in money, they're not going to come to. And that's why it was critical that we found a financial institution to replace the TD Bank, because that, Without having a, a bank as an anchor, that was critical to having a draw for people to come to do business downtown. But we have to do more to make it attractive. Uxbridge, Stoneville, Newmarket are great examples of what we could do to revitalize our downtown core. Thank you. 
Thank you. I agree with uh, Scott's position, and as a current member, a uh, director on the Mount Albert Village Association, as well as on the Revitalization Committee, we have been in meetings to uh, make recommendations to the town to work to beautify, and then most importantly, to approve signage in the area, because I believe that the signs on Highway 48 and other entry points from the town are inadequate. We need to work hard to let the people in cars on Highway 48 know that they should turn down Princess and head to the corner of Main and uh, Center Street and to spend their money and to support local businesses. So I believe that we should build on the momentum that has been started by the uh, by the investment of Tampa in the community. And I think that going forward, we should uh, meet with landlords and we should get them invested in beautifying the Main Street because it's such a quaint town with a wonderful atmosphere and I can see it being a wonderful historical heritage town. Thank you. Yeah. I'm not going to disagree with either of those comments and I'm sure that uh, Melanie will agree with us as well. The, one of the issues is that we have absent owners of some of those buildings and to get them interested in spending money in our downtown core where we only live here is, is a problem. And I would love to see some of our downtown area have some of the buildings that we had years ago and some of the businesses. I mean, growing up there, we had far more traffic than we've ever had now. And people up north just don't come down anymore. We've got to find a way to entice them to do it. I'm going to take a page out of Toronto, Queen Street. I agree with Kathy. We've got absentee owners or landlords that don't have anything sitting in their, in their stores. Downtown Toronto, what they're doing is giving incentives back to landowners that will fill that, that frontage of that store for over a year. Your taxes are then therefore given some sort of rebate. I think that would be a good incentive to get the downtown going. The other thing downtown going is once we get that park going downtown on Main Street, which has been in hell for a while. If we have that Odeon going, we can have park, we can have plays, we can have different types of outdoor activities. The whole downtown isn't just Main Street. It's also Center Street. It's a combined unit all together. And I think there should be some incentives given through taxes for landowners in order for those businesses to start taking place in the beautification of the heritage of the downtown. Thank you. Yeah, yeah I, there was just two points extra that I wanted, I wanted to add, and I agree. I think as, as a town, we could be adding incentives to encourage uh, landlords to uh, spruce up their, their buildings and make it look as, as historical as, uh, as Kathy remembers and as I remember. Uh, and, you know, uh, and as well, I think, I think MATA needs to be congratulated for the work that they're doing. I know it's not done yet. But uh, they're doing a lot of great work, and they need to be congratulated for spending the time. It's volunteer hours. They need our thanks. And I would like to say a few more words about the incredible potential that Mount Albert has in terms of attracting more jobs and better facilities to the downtown area. Uh, I've been speaking to um, residents while knocking on doors. They were suggesting putting together a farmer's market next to the community center as well as um, uh, creating uh, reasons, and that's why signage is so important, to come to the downtown core. So as one of my platforms is to, re to spearhead the revitalization, it is critical also to diversify the tax base by bringing in new businesses and by supporting local businesses. So it would be a very good idea moving forward to have an official business uh, group that um, focuses on these needs, working with the revitalization. All right, next question. Uh, this time we'll start with Kathy. Go in that direction. Are you or have you ever in the past accepted developer or developer adjacent donations or contributions? I'm not sure what developer adjacent contribution is, but does that mean something to you? Okay, let's just say, have you ever accepted a developer 
donations or contributions? Yes, in the past I have. That does not mean that I can be bought. And I think even the developers, after listening to me many, many times at the council, at the council table, figured that out. Because there's many times that I've voted against quite a, a lot of their um, ideas and suggestions. And it's something that, um, it's, it's expensive to run for council. I mean, we're talking about uh, or maybe increasing the salary and certainly not lowering it, then the same could be said for the amount of money it costs to run a really good campaign so that you get absolutely phenomenal members sitting behind that council chamber. Susan? As a professional art appraiser, I have actually come across this circumstance where people intend to influence your uh, values that you put on uh, artwork whether they're donating them or they're selling them and they don't want to pay the appropriate taxes to the government. And uh, people have offered me bribes in the, in the art business. And I have always immediately said no, because what is most important to me is my reputation. If I don't have my reputation, I have nothing. And I value that beyond any amount of money that anybody could um, offer me to compromise that. And if I compromise my integrity, it's not something I'm prepared to do. Uh, uh, my campaign is being funded uh, entirely by uh, friends and family. Um, I, I have to say that I've, uh, uh, like Kathy, I, I, take, I take exception to the, to the thought that you can be bought by, for $1,200. And like Susan, I've, I've, in the past, I've been proffered bribes uh, to backdate coverage on insurance uh, policy or forget about claim. Uh, I've rejected the bribes outright every time uh, because it would have ended my career and it would have ruined my integrity and I could not look myself in the mirror. So uh, there you have it. Well, with regards to taking anything from any outside sources, I'm on the Heritage Advisory Committee and I volunteer myself. I'm a single mom. I own my own house, and I'm working this campaign totally by myself, right to the bare bones. There is no way that I would take any donations because I look right at that. So the first thing I look at is what kind of reputation would you have if you take any gifts, donations, or charitable donations of some sort from any benefactors? My reputation, even if I don't get elected, I still live in this area, I still want to hang my head up high, and I'm going to walk forward with that. Any rebuttals? Uh, I'd also like to add uh, that, uh, as the others have indicated how they're funding their campaigns, I am spending my own personal money and have only accepted money from immediate family and very close friends because I'm an independent person. <laughs> And I actually find it very challenging to ask others for money. This is a hard ask. And, uh, but I believe that I'm worth the investment from my immediate family and friends. And I intend to give 150% in terms of my effort to make them proud. And it's a full-time job on these campaigns I am learning. So thank you very much. Kathy? You will notice that I did say pass. Now we can't take funds from developers. So it's not, a, it's not an issue to be raised. And the thing is, my integrity, I think my integrity stands the way it always has done. And I can look myself in the mirror at the end of the day and say, Kathy, you've done a great job. Thank you. Next question, we'll start with Susan, and then we'll Scott and come back to you. Recently, the town went through a review of the current zoning bylaws. Many Ward 3 residents would have been impacted by the early post changes. What are your thoughts on where we landed and the process of that that got us there? There is a great deal of confusion about the wards, as I have discovered while knocking on doors. And, um, in terms of the ward system, I think we are very fortunate uh, to be in an area that is protected. Sorry. Yeah. I'll just 
The question was about the zoning changes, not the ward changes. Oh, okay. Can you repeat the question? Sure, I'll read it again. Recently, the town went through a review of the current zoning bylaws. Many Ward 3 residents have been impacted by early proposed changes. What are your thoughts on where we landed in the process that got us there? I see, okay. Well, um, I've attended many of the town council meetings where they have discussed issues of, such as zoning. Uh, I saw it as a on-the-job training because I wanted to see exactly what the process is and how the town council and mayor function. And I saw very, I saw many unhappy uh, residents uh, expressing their displeasure with the changes that have taken place in the zone. <laughs> and again, difficult decisions had to be made. Uh, what I can say to address that is that the needs of the many in a community often have to take precedence over the needs of certain uh, exemptions or special situations. We are compassionate as, as individuals, and I believe we all bring that compassion to town council. But if you're making decisions and not everybody is 100% satisfied, if compromises have to be made, then probably you're doing a pretty good job if not everybody is satisfied at the end of the day in a, in a strange way. I would say that. Okay. I, uh, I attended a number of these meetings, and uh, and I think we're talking about a comprehensive policy review. And uh, I tell you, I didn't hear about it until a friend told me about it. And I was very concerned. It, I, I, would, I would characterize the communication around this um, process inadequate. Uh, the process was mandated by the province, by the way, to, uh, to do a review of our zoning. Uh, so I thought the communication could have been better. Uh, and in most cases, it was the rural parts of of East PG that was impacted. And I have to tell you that this really drives home the need for having a ward councillor. And as the only, I think I'm the only rural candidate uh, that's running, uh, that you need someone there that's going to reflect that opinion, the views of the rural residents. Because if some of the proposals had gone through, it would have seriously impacted the property values of people living on the concession roads. And so to me, that was uh, a real shame that we didn't have better communication around it. Thankfully, we landed in the right spot, I think. I've gone over my time. Um, first of all, I'd like to say I was born and raised on a farm. So rural is in my blood. My grandparents still live on the farm over Germany. So with rural understanding, I get it. But however, with the new zoning, the LPAT, which replaced the OMB, are the ones who did it. As a municipal level, it's hard to really kind of negate that with the province, because once the province has made their mind up, especially with Bill 31 that just got passed, there's not much you can do. So I think going from there, we have to revisit how we're going to use those zones and how they're going to be more effective. Thank you. I understand that the zoning bylaw that Councillor voted to leave things the way they were, especially in rural areas. It was opposed by the Lake Central Conservation Authority, and right now it is on hold, I believe. And uh, there are still four properties that are still under review. So I think it's on hold until after the uh, Conservation Authority takes a look at things and decides what they're going to do with certain properties. Any rebuttal? All right. I'm trying to get as much right in the questions as I can. There are a number of questions that are very similar to this one, so I'm going to read this one. And this will be the last question before we do our two minute closings. And so I guess we'll start with Scott, if we've been going in that direction. Uh, the town has a multi-million dollar budget to manage of our, our, of our hard-earned money. What experience do you have in managing a budget and an organization of that size? Well, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, when I was uh, part of leadership of an uh, insurance company, uh, I managed personally a multi-million dollar budget for my own 
department. I had about 40% of the entire staff reporting it to me at one point. I never exceeded my budget. I always pride myself of maintaining tight, tight controls so that things were delivered efficiently. And I always pushed my team to find new ways to save money and do things, do more with less. But over and above that, we had, uh, as a member of the executive team, we were stewards of nearly half a billion dollars of capital and assets. And that's a lot of dough. And so we, you know, we had very strict controls around that. We did reviews all the time. And I think this is a skill set and some experience that I can bring to the council table and, and make sure that our tax dollars are wisely spent. My, uh, my campaign colors are, are black and yellow. I like that because it stands out, but also because it's uh, the color of no frills. And that's what I believe in. I think as a collective group should be more the idea. Uh, I am a funeral director. Yes, I am the last person to let you down. However, <laughs> stating that, I'd like to point out that as a funeral director, families give me the most trusted part of their lives. When someone passes away, there is no monetary value to that person that has passed away. And you're entrusting me with that to ensure that all the arrangements and that going forward is a very important step in one's life. I'm asking you now to give me the availability to entrust me with your living and your lifestyle and the affordability in this community. And again, I think with doing that individual question, because I don't have that availability like Scott does, it's not a necessary reflection, so I think it's a multi-group combination. Thank you. Kathy? Well, I have over 30 years of experience with the bank, working with all kinds of money, and 14 years on council. I made decisions along with other members of council we're going to do with our budgets and the millions of dollars that are flowing through. Susan. As a professional art appraiser, I've handled internationally um, appraisals worth in the millions of dollars. Uh, however, I take pride in the fact that I gave the same attention and that my fees did not depend on the value of the artwork that I was working on. So I gave the same care and attention and respect uh, to detail uh, with every single client, regardless of the value of the property that I was appraising. I, we all bring different perspectives to the job of town council, and I think that would be a strength rather than a weakness. Uh, that you don't want an entire town council made up of uh, financial advisors or lawyers. Um, you need people with different backgrounds and arts and education and other professions. And as a self-employed person for the past 18 years, I have worked hard for every dollar I have made, so I am very fiscally aware and responsible about making decisions regarding budget for the town. Thank you. Any rebuttals? Yes, Scott? It, it, should, it should also be added that in my, my past experience, uh, we were heavily regulated by the government. So not unlike how the government, the provincial government, would get into our the municipalities' affairs if things were being managed properly. I'm used to having uh, an oversight of the government, uh, and if things were in order, you hurt really fast, and the penalties were staggered. But uh, I think you know uh, all of us would treat our, our tax dollars with respect. I think that this that this end would treat our tax dollars with respect. Thank you. No one else? Okay. All right, we will start the, uh, you, we'll do the reverse order. So we'll start with Scott, but two minute close, and end with Melinda. Thank well, thank you for being here tonight and, and hanging in this long. Uh, and I want to give a special thank you to all the organizers for putting this together. Events like these rarely come together uh, without the efforts of great volunteers. You know, this is an important election. We will be adding at least four new council members who don't currently have a seat on council. 
And we are all applying for a job. And all of you, the voters, are the hiring managers. I want you to think about who you want to be your voice on council. Think about the skill set that each of us would bring to the table. And to think about past performance. I firmly believe that we need a council that is going to not only push town staff to deliver their best, but we need as councillors to push each other to be our best. And that's what we owe you, the voters. And it's important to note that we will be, we will, while, we, while we will be electing by our, by our respective wards, we are all accountable to you, no matter what ward you live in. And it's incumbent upon you that if you have an issue, you can talk to anyone on the council. Because we're making decisions that, that will apply to the entire town. For me, I think there are a few good reasons why I should earn one of your votes to be on council. Number one, I have a range of experience working with small business to large corporations. I have a track record to ensure that your tax dollars will be well managed. Two, I believe I'm the only candidate from the rural part of Ward 3, and I believe it's critical that someone at the council table that not only speaks for rural concerns, but also understands them personally. And I have a work, an excellent working relationship with Mayor Haxon, and should she be re-elected, I know we will be able to deliver great results for Ward 3. On October 22nd, we will be hiring two new councillors for Ward 3, and I hope to have earned your support to be one of them. Thank you. It would be a privilege to have the opportunity to serve you as a town councillor. And when I was in town council yesterday during the meeting, I was looking up at the flags hanging from the, the ceiling, all about the community character attributes that are looked for in town councillors and in the community as a whole. And of those 12 attributes, uh, which are even carved on the sidewalk outside of, uh, outside of the Civic Centre, I believe that I embody the qualities that are needed. Uh, primarily, optimism. I always see in opportunities. Uh, sometimes that people see them as problems and challenges. I see them as opportunities, and I take a positive, open mind towards making decisions. Uh, I believe in integrity, as I have touched on before, and I believe in courage. Um, it took some courage for all of us who have entered this race and to appear before you tonight uh, to put our names forward in the public circle. I've already been asked by, even just as a candidate, I'm not a town councillor yet, uh, by members of the community to help them with issues. And I've already received criticism from uh, individuals in the community, uh, even though I'm not a town councillor yet. And, uh, and so it's important when you're making your vote and you're voting for two people in each ward that you think very carefully about who brings a new, energetic, fresh perspective to the wards. We are a growing community and we need to grow in terms of our professionalism and our respect and our principal way. And so think about that. Think about that long and hard because you don't want to waste your democratic vote. You need to educate yourselves and I would appreciate the opportunity to serve you in town council. Thank you very much. <coughs> First of all, I want to thank each and every one of you for sitting through this whole evening and staying as long as you have done so far, and uh, I guess for a little bit longer once the American candidates come up here. I want to thank the Chamber of Commerce for taking the opportunity of allowing us to come and uh, participate in this this evening, and to uh, Stefan for your wonderful uh, um, control of the event. I do have 14 years of experience on council, and I too actually was born on a farm, and I have worked with many devoted councillors and staff to improve our municipality and work hard to get us to this point that we are now. I look forward, with your help, to doing so again. And I also want to believe that we would be able to get more residents interested in what we're doing in this community if we are able to have more evening minutes, or more, more evening meetings. So, because I want to represent you, I listen, I care, 
and I take action. So please support me on October the 22nd. my fellow candidates have said, and again, thank you everyone for coming this evening and sitting for such a long period of time. I am a people person. I always have been. I have no problems walking into a room and talking to so many people that I've never met before. By the time I leave, I know your name, who you're related to, and if I'm even related to you. Going from there, it's been an amazing experience from this side of the fence to Forward, to be trying to come out and be part of the community and to be involved in civic duty. Going out to people's houses, knocking on doors, hearing people's concerns, hearing people's congratulatory ideas of me running or others and their ideas. It's amazing. I want to be the type of counselor that when you see me at Foodland or just down in town on Main Street or walking through or wherever, I want you to be able to feel that you can come up and talk to me. That you have an issue. I may not have the answer right, right away, and I'm certainly not going to blow smoke your way and make you feel happy. I'm not going to promise, and I'm not going to go forward thinking that my personality is hanging on these promises. There's always a reason behind everything. Example, the lights in Mount Albert. There's been such a talk about that, but there is a reason behind that. The problem is, again, it comes back to transparency with what's been brought up before, and it's explanation and probably assumptions on both sides of the fence by the general public and those who are in government on many levels. I want you to think that I may not have the experience, maybe even the life experience of some others, but I have got a lot of experience through the life that I do at the young age I do. I also come from a political background from a family that's full of politics. Please consider me as one of your candidates for Ward 3, October 22nd. Thank you. Thanks to you, candidates for Ward 3. All right, we're going to move right along to the three candidates for trustee. Uh, we did organize a specific debate for trustees, but three have chosen to come up and speak. And I want to point out that while most people seem less interested in the trustee, they actually spend a lot more of your taxpayers in the York region than the counselors ever will in East Orleans. So it's worth listening to what they have to say. So if you've got the three trustees come and have a seat, please. Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, thank you for Chamber of Commerce for realizing the importance of hearing the trustee voice. All of us trustee candidates are grateful for the opportunity to speak to you today. I want to talk to you about two things, the role of the trustee and how important it is to have the right person doing that job. And second, a little bit about me to try to persuade you why I am the right candidate for this position. Board of Trustees, at least for the York Region District School Board Chairman and Forum, they manage a budget of $1.4 billion annually. $1.4 billion. 20% of your tax dollars goes towards the school board, whether or not you have a child in the system. Don't be careful with education. Don't we want our public education to be the best that it possibly can be? If we don't have children in the system now, the students who are there are those who will take care of us in the future. The current students will be the future doctors, the future lawyers, the future engineers, the future pilots. Those students, when they come to take care of you as a doctor, don't you want them to have had the best education they possibly could have had? The mere flying down to Florida for the winter, the pilot who's going to be piloting that plane, don't you want him or her to have had the best education possible so they can do the job? <coughs> education is everybody's business. And that is why it is really important to take the time
to look at the candidates running for the trustee position because this person will be working with the team, of course, with the board, the entire board, to set the vision and to set strategies in place for public education here in your region and actually in Ontario as well. They're the ones who are going to be allocating resources to make sure those priorities get taken care of and they get done. And it's not just spouting off the mouth and not putting their money where the mouth is. The crazy conversation to me. Why me? Well, a little bit about myself. Um, a lot of people basically will probably know because I am very much about town. Um, I was born in Guyana. I, I've dedicated in the British system in Guyana. I was raised by a village, in a village. I moved to Canada in 1991 to attend university, University of Toronto. My parents were school teachers. From a very young age, the importance of education, school, and community was instilled in me, and I never lost that. To this day, my happy places were the school or the library. I care a lot about this community. And what I wanted to do was make sure that I am not only here, but I did something about it. I have two young boys, they're 10 years old and 8 years old. They go to Queensland Public School. Ever since they started school, I have been involved in education at the school level, at the council level, and also at the board level. I was appointed to the Equity and Inclusivity Advisory Committee at the York Region District School Board. We did public consultations this year, about seven or eight consultations throughout the York region, talking to parents, talking to residents, talking to community members about their issues about racism, classism, among other things. Then we put together recommendations to the board. I also sit in the Parent Engagement Advisory Committee at the York Region District School Board because I believe that education is a collective responsibility. It's not just the school, it's not just the parents, not just the community, it is all of us. We all need to work together to make the education of our children a priority and make sure they get the best education possible. In addition to all of that, which are strictly voluntary, anyway, I sit on the board of East Gilbert Public Library and I sit on the board of Oscar Georgina. I have worked with diversity organizations in Newark. The point I'm trying to make is, this is what it does to all me. I'm passionate about education and literacy. I'm passionate about community building. I have experience in governance, it's a responsibility. But that's not the full reason why I'm running. Somebody asked my angel, do you like school, Hayden? Hayden said, I don't like school. I love school. Every single child in the system should love school. And that's what I want for our children. If that is your vision too, please vote for me. Leave a thing for your vision to school board trustee. Thank you. It just so for my clarification, the can announce also you said your Bridge Public School Board. There are four school boards in case you didn't know. There's a public, English public. English Catholic, French Catholic, and French Catholic, and who you vote for depends on where you direct your tax dollar. So the next uh, person on the list is Sean Gaudet. Let's say that as a French. I said it's French, or is that how you pronounce it? Good evening, everybody, and thanks to the East Portland Bureau Chamber of Commerce for inviting me today. My name is Sean Gaudet and I am your candidate for the York Catholic District School Board. Trustee, I am a dedicated individual and I possess strong communication skills. I have excellent problem solving skills and I have strong faith. It's time for a change. The taxpayers in East Willowbury have had the York Catholic District School Board run deficits year after year after year and nothing is being done about it. It's time for some fresh and innovative ideas that puts the students' needs first. I will strive to increase the awareness of child and youth mental health issues and bullying and focus on expanding special needs services that need to be more effective within our school system. Your vote for me ensures more transparency and better education for your children that prepares them for the 21st century learning while balancing the budget. 
I want to ensure that the future curriculum being considered by the provincial government will be taught in our schools in a manner that is faithful to the church's teachings. And I believe parents are the primary educators for their children, and it's important that parents continue the role of teaching family life issues to their children. I'm committed to promoting mental well-being for all of our students. And I will listen to your concerns and be your voice for Catholic education and help guide parents through their difficult situations while providing you feedback all the way. The taxpayers of East Willowbury have incurred the York Catholic District School Board Trustees deficits for many years, and it's time for a change. Currently, the York Catholic District School Board has approved the budget with a $2.8 million deficit. And parents are the taxpayers, and I want to be as transparent as possible to everyone in East Willowbury. The trustees have the, should have the best interest of the taxpayers as their primary consideration. I believe there is a need for greater coherence between the parish, the school, and the home. It is important to encourage more support from local parish pastors at the school level to further community togetherness. <coughs> we can strengthen and open more lines of communication by encouraging meetings between the local pastor, parents, and faculty together as one. So thank you to the East Willowbury Chamber of Commerce for inviting me today, and thank you to everyone that's attending here tonight at this event to learn how I will change the York Catholic District School Board to help ensure our students achieve academic success in the 21st century learning environment. I want to ensure better services for our special needs students, ensure fiscal responsibility by balancing the budget, and put students' needs ahead of the school system's needs. I want to provide more resources and upgrade existing resources in our schools to help our students meet the needs of a challenging workforce. I will celebrate student achievements, improve inclusiveness, be responsible, integral, transparent, and community focused for your children's education career. If you want change on October 22nd, vote for me, Sean Gallet. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa McNichol. Thank you. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the East Willow Barry Chamber of Commerce for uh, having this event tonight. As your Catholic school trustee, I have led our community to future in education. I am seeking re-election because the role of education is more crucial than ever in today's world. I am a local candidate. I have a style, hands-on approach. In the schools, I attend council meetings, subcommittees, or these phone calls. Actually, I, sometimes people think they see too much of me. Recently, we have a new school, Our Lady Good Council, a brand new building with the help of the board. Right now, I'm working on several projects. One is having Sacred Heart Catholic High School designated as a regional arts program for the North. Our Lady of Lake and Georgina as having an advanced program and a French immersion from 7 through 12. Remember, the board has a very special partnership between school, home, and supported by the church. We must remain vigilant on maintaining a safe and healthy environment for all students and staff. You can continue to trust my accountability, accessibility, and availability. I have the experience. Thank you. Thank you very much, trustee candidates. Uh, I'm sure many people have questions for trustees, and I'm sure that they'd be happy to talk to you either later or if you contact them uh, afterwards. There, it is an important question, so thank you for coming. And now, for what you've all been waiting for, the mayoral debates. If I can have the mayor candidates, please.
Uh, so why don't we get started? Virginia? Thank you very much. It's uh, wonderful to be here, and thank you to the Chamber for setting up this uh, meeting. It's very important for our de democratic right. Uh, I've been asked why I'm running for third term. Plain and simple, there's more to be done. I want to see through the completion of projects that have commenced this past term, including the opening of our Health and Active Living Plaza, which we will have a pool, a library, program rooms, a child care facility, and several outdoor facilities. The opening of the Operations Centre, which includes the removal of the workshop at the arena here, thus providing four acres of opportunity for recreation facilities. <coughs> this past term has been a terrific year with many accomplishments under my leadership as your mayor. Some of the highlights include, we are debt-free and our town reserves are at $47 million. They're the highest they have ever been. We have one of the lowest tax rates in the GTA. We maximize alternative funding opportunities through partnerships, joint purchasing and grants for our waste collection contract, animal control, shelter services, our fire master plan, and a new aerial fire truck. We've done this while hiring more full-time emergency services staff, including 11 new parks and refurbishing existing ones while maintaining quality services for all our residents. We welcome Duke of Financial Institution in Mount Albert. We implemented a ward system of electing counselors, and here's a prime example tonight. We will begin live streaming of all council meetings in 2019. Over the next four years, the town will complete com complete the first phase of growth with 7,000 homes, welcoming over 24,000 people. Managing growth right means protecting 70% of our town as green space. Residents will live in close proximity to a network of trails, farms, market gardens, and equestrian centers. We will continue discussions with the Mayor of Bradford, Region of York, and provincial government to solve the gridlock on our roads between the 404 and the 400. I have heard the concerns from many residents regarding South Lake Hospital's ability to deal with the increasing demand. I have been actively engaged on a committee with South Lake Hospital to find solutions at the local level. I'll continue to work with the region of York, the provincial government, including our local MPP, to address the delay in the Upper York sewage solution. It is no longer acceptable to have Holland Landing sewage lagoons, and I will fight to have them decommissioned. To address the long overdue need to have quality broadband through as well, Mary, I currently sit on the task force at York Region, and will continue to be your voice at the table to get this in place as soon as possible. With our growing population and our new businesses coming down, broadband is essential. I'll talk really fast. It has been demonstrated that under strong and experienced leadership, we can build new homes and businesses, conserve our natural heritage, and continue to support our agricultural community. It's exciting times in East Willowbury. I represent positive leadership with proven results, and I want to serve this community as mayor for the next four years. Thank you. It is right now. 
Uh, at this point, that's all I have to say. Thank you. All right, we'll begin with the questions. Interestingly enough, everybody seems to be happy with the salary of mayors because that question was not included by reducing the <laughs> salary. So you have to answer that. Question, first question. So we will start with Ray first. We're just going to alternate back and forth as to who starts the question. How do you plan to make EG more safe for vulnerable road uses such as pedestrians and cyclists? Um, number one, you have to work with the police. Number two is you have to identify which area are the worst and you work that first. And uh, it, that is very important to make every child, every single citizen of BG safe. Um, I will work with everybody possible to make that safe. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we have uh, continually hear about uh, traffic and the speed that people travel, and it's unfortunate that our community is such now that people have uh, they have less patience on the road, and uh, they always seem to be in a, in a big hurry. Uh, the, one of the first things that we can take a look at: uh, the town has a speed sign that uh, we can put up at any uh, road. And it gives us an understanding of exactly what speed people are traveling. There's also an opportunity with a couple of them from the region, which we would be working as well, that actually take license plate numbers. So it's a, it's a study in advance, but what we need to do is work with a lot of groups and make sure that uh, regional roads are working with the region and in the municipality, uh, those roads that are, are ours, that we would be working with our traffic analysts and our traffic specialists uh, who are full-time employees of the town. You now each have an opportunity for a one-minute rebuttal if you want. Okay. Next question. What will you do to increase the level of regional recognition of EG's need? With the chairman no longer in elected position, the region has little need to little need to place EG's needs in front of the southern tier cities. Virginia, uh, for me, it uh, really doesn't make a difference whether they're elected or whether they're appointed. We did very well in East Mulberry with uh, almost uh, 500 million dollars in infrastructure from the region of York in the last four years. So it's all about working with that individual who's leading and making sure that not only are you working with the chair, he's just the chair. It's important, we won't tell him that I said that. Just the chair, but more importantly, working with staff who understand your needs, the department heads, and, and trying to uh, bring them to our community and show them exactly the needs that we have. And making sure that attendance, that you are there at every regional council and committee meeting because that's where the decisions are made. Frank? Yes, absolutely. Uh, you have to work with the person who is elected or somebody puts them in there. Uh, it's very important for the EG residents to provide the proper um, roads or whatever we need, schools, or anything that we need. So that person, uh, you have to work with them very, very, very hard. Any rebuttal? <laughs> when can we expect to have internet? We live outside of town and pay astronomical fees for almost zero service. The hub from the library is a big help, but we wait months for our turn to use it. Michael? I, yes, um, uh, when I was collecting my signature, I got approached out of 25, 20 of them, they were very disappointed where internet is at. It's not fast enough, we need that right away, as soon as possible. How am I going to do that? Until I get in there, see which way is the fastest way to get it. Because it is very important for them to have high speed internet. 
that works for this area. I can't agree more. I'm not done. Oh, and so um, I, oh, I heard the discussion earlier across the table here, and um, there are grants available from the federal government. In fact, uh, I had an opportunity to go to Ottawa a couple of years ago and talk about broadband with a couple of the ministers. And the difficulty is that because we're within the GTA, then we don't qualify. So then we start to take a look at what is out there, and that was one of the reasons I got on the broad, broadband uh, task force at the region because collectively they were bringing in a lot of different operators. And the, uh, the task force is at a point now where there are a number of, of, of businesses that are prepared to come forward. It's going to cost money. And it's a matter of taking a look and finding out which one can deliver the most. We have pockets of East Wallabury that have very good uh, uh, internet. We have some that are, are very poor. So it's a matter of continuing to work with the region who brought all these people in and know a lot more about that. Any rebuttals? No? Okay. Given the provincial mandate making EG a high growth community and the region's failure to provide access to needed infrastructure, sewage capacity, in brackets, what strategies will you follow in order to get employment lands developed by 2021 so residential taxpayers don't have to bear the vast majority of taxation burdens? It's quite specific. Virginia? Could you repeat that? Sure, I'll repeat it's, it's, it's a long one. It is quite specific. Given the provincial mandate making EG a high growth municipality and the region's failure to provide access to needed infrastructure, i.e. sewage capacity, what strategies will you follow in order to get the employment lands developed by 2021 so residential taxpayers don't have to bear the vast majority of taxation burdens? Thank you. Um, you didn't mention nothing York, so it was just a, so it didn't stick with me for the moment. So uh, the Upper York Sewage Solution, um, we can talk about that very quickly, has not been passed by the province. It's not the region, it is the province, although the, problem, the region makes application for it. The land has been uh, purchased on the second concession. There is uh, almost $200 million placed into uh, that land already to prepare it for the Upper York. And it's a matter of having the Ministry of the Environment deal with the application. In the meantime, we have opportunities when we have uh, land along the Green Lane, which is, is good employment of land, to work with our neighboring municipality uh, to the south, uh, particularly at Harry Walker Parkway, where the sewage uh, pipes are in the ground on the wrong side of Green Lane, and we need to get them on the other side. So it's a matter of getting an employer that wants to come, and then we know that we can spend money. Franco? Uh, yes, for the sewer budget. And uh, I'd like to um, uh, have a like, discussion with the town, where can we go with this, and who can we ask to get more money for not for the taxpayer to take all the burden. Um, the province, uh, we pay a lot of tax to the province, and we should have some of that back to make the EG residents comfortable. That's it, thank you. Okay, any rebuttals? Next question. How do you plan to preserve civility, diversity, and equal opportunity? And Frank will be first. Uh, yes, um, what, I, what I like to do is I like to treat everybody fairly, um, take the time and make sure that every step that we've taken, it is the right step for the residents. Virginia? I think uh, the most important thing that we do in East Columbia right now is uh, welcoming new residents and we know that we've welcomed some thousand new residents in a very short period of time. Uh, I hear from them a lot. I'm out talking to them at their front doors or at events that take place 
And it's the events that the town hosts right now where people come and meet other people. And that's that's how people feel comfortable in a new community. If they don't meet new people, then they head back to where they came from if it's, if it's a, a driving distance. Uh, I, I think we take a, a page from uh, York Regional Police and how they uh, have an inclusivity uh, charter. And in fact, um, we will be dealing with our inclusivity charter within the next uh, uh, first part of council uh, into, the, into the new term. Well, for those that have not been in the council chamber, we have uh, the character attributes around the council chamber and at every meeting. I point out to people that uh, that's how we deal with people and it's with courtesy and respect. Any rebuttal? A very general one. How do you plan to combat climate change and CO2 emissions? <laughs> Are you going to save the world? Virginia? I'm, I'm not sure that there's an answer to that. Uh, it is coming. We all know it is coming. Uh, I think uh, the fact that East Golden Bear is going to be 70% green uh, certainly helps us in the long term. Our uh, flora and fauna, our rivers and our streams and, and tributaries. Uh, we're making sure that they're going to be here for us, which, which will help temperature somewhat, but um, if we ever find an answer, I'd like to hear it. Franco? Yes, it's a question to answer, uh, but we've got to try to do our best. Uh, every single citizen, um, if they have an idea, uh, they should bring it forward. Uh, that way we can implement, it makes sense. And uh, that's how we got to work together to make it better for everybody. I assume there's no rebuttal to that. <laughs> this will be the last question before we do the closing statements. And we'll start with Franco. Where in the budget can cost savings be found? I've not been a councillor, I've not been on here before, and it's hard for me to answer. Um, but I would like to start to talk to every single department in town, in the township, and see where can we make some savings. Virginia. Thank you. Um, cost savings uh, are uh, always desired. This last year or two, We've partnered with a number of the municipalities local to us, and uh, I talked about that earlier, and the fact that we purchased together. So instead of us paying separately for an animal shelter, we're now with four municipalities. Uh, there are other items as well, but I think the best one uh, that is the most visual for everyone is we have garbage trucks that are running up and down our roads in all municipalities, and uh, they would stop at the boundaries because the contract was only for East Columbury or Georgina or King or, or uh, Wichert, Stowe, Newmarket and Aurora. And we uh, got together with the other municipalities and there is one contract now. And you'll notice when a truck comes down the road, you'll see it cross over from Green Lane and go right into Newmarket and just keep on going down Main Street. Not only does it save money, uh, it's more efficient and, and, and better for the environment because the truck is not stopping and starting, it's going right through. Any rebuttals? All right, we'll now do two minutes uh, closing remarks and we'll reverse the order. So, Franco, you can go first, please. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Shaw, for coming again. And, uh, I'd like to say um, I'm going to come and visit you guys, uh, hopefully all of you guys, and I'd like to hear your input and suggestion. Uh, that way I can bring it forward to the town and make some good changes. Thank you. Thank you.
like to thank the Chamber for organizing tonight, and uh, I'm very happy that we had good numbers up here. It's really important. I'm proud of the great progress under my leadership that has made this term, and I will continue if you re-elect me as your mayor. Communication with residents is at an all-time high, and we are using the town page, social media, our new website, community events, and electronic newsletters to keep people in the touch. All are reflective of positive leadership. My priorities as your mayor, I will continue to plan and manage our economic growth. I will keep taxes low while ensuring the delivery of quality services. I will be a strong voice, your voice, at York Region Council. I will provide a variety of options for residents' input into decision making. I will be dedicated to the environment and seek out innovative green solutions. I will be available to listen to your concerns through many options, including my one-on-one -on -one sessions. And I will continue a dialogue with partners to address seniors' housing, and I will continue to work with South Lake Regional Health Center to ensure that the health needs of our growing community are going to be met. I have proven experience to continue to lead these global barriers for man. Last month, I celebrated 25 years as an elected official representing East School Mary. Seven years as your public school board trustee, 10 years as your voice as a counselor in East School Mary. In the past eight years, I have had the honor of being your mayor. You elect counselors to respond to your day-to-day -day concerns. You elect the mayor to provide leadership. Leadership at the town, at the region, and even at the provincial level. So who you want to represent you? Someone who says he would like to be the leader or someone who is a proven leader and has the experience to show for it? Please vote for me and touch me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So thank you all of you for coming. Thank you for participating, for listening, and for being a very uh, polite, civil audience. I really appreciate it. Uh, we didn't have any people. Thank you. Have a good night.